the Rules Committee will come to order. Today marks 132 days since a violent mob attacked the Capitol and tried to stop the certification of a free and fair election in the United States of America. Five people died, hundreds more were injured, and our democracy was shaken to its core. As horrific as that day was, we know it could have been much worse, much worse if not for the heroic actions of many people in this building. Some rioters were searching for Vice President Pence to execute him as a traitor, while others threatened to storm offices and physically remove and even kill others. There was widespread damage to the Capitol, but the emotional toll for so many was incalculable, and it will stay with us forever. This was not a normal tourist visit, as one of my Republican colleagues recently claimed. The truth matters, especially when something as fundamental as our democracy is at stake. We need to get to the bottom of exactly what happened and make sure that it never, ever happens again. H.R. 3233 will establish a commission to investigate the January 6th attacks. It's designed after the 9-11 Commission and will be led by experts, not politicians. I'm glad that the chairman and ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee reached a bipartisan deal to finally make this commission a reality. I'm especially pleased that it focused solely on what happened on January 6th and not on other unrelated witch hunts that some of my Republican colleagues have called for. I look forward to its report at the end of the year, but make no mistake, we need to act now to respond to what we've learned so far and to support a demoralized Capitol Police that is stretched way too thin. H.R. 3237 will provide $1.9 billion to secure the safety of the Capitol, protect facilities, members, employees, and vis visitors going forward, and it would provide for safe and, and, and healthy congressional operations. Already, we have received the Capitol Security Review and discussed this matter at a bipartisan briefing. Twelve subcommittee hearings and countless conversations with members and experts. I pray that we never ever see another day like January 6th, but that's not enough. We need to follow the facts and to act to not only protect the Capitol and those that walk its halls, but our very democracy. Now let me turn to the ranking member for any comments he wishes to make. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, before I begin, just always great to see my two favorite appropriators, one of whom happens to be the chairwoman, one of whom happens to be the ranking member. And uh, glad to have uh, both my good friends here today. Uh, today's hearing, Mr. Chairman, covers two items. The first measure I'll discuss is H.R. 3237, an appropriations bill that provides supplemental security funding for the Capitol complex. It provides $1.9 billion for security upgrades, including funding for the United States uh, Capitol Police, the National Guard, and other agencies that responded to the January 6th attack and that are continuing to provide security to the complex, as well as uh, funds to address the coronavirus relief within the legislative branch. Uh, though this bill started out with bipartisan negotiations, my understanding is that Democrats walked away from the Republican counteroffer, choosing instead to go it alone with the partisan bill before us today. Unfortunately, I must oppose it. And it's truly unfortunate that on a matter of this gravity, that Democrats were not interested in agreement. Republicans on the Appropriations Committee, including myself, have deep concerns about the top-line numbers of this bill, as well as the provision that creates a rapid response force within the uh, D.C. National Guard, rather than one controlled by and housed within Congress. I look forward to hearing from Ranking Member Granger on the process that led us to this point, as well as hearing her additional concerns about today's bill. I trust that today's measure will not be the final word, and I look forward to eventually supporting a bipartisan security supplemental bill that we can all agree on, and it will ultimately go to the President Biden's desk. Our second item, H.R. 3233, establishes a national commission to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol complex. Before I continue, I want to extend my thanks to Ranking Member Katko and Chairman Thompson the Homeland Security Committee for their hard work in putting this legislation together. The two of them took an unworkable proposal from the Speaker and then turned it into the bill we see today, which is a far, far better bill. 
I'm deeply grateful to both of them for their hard work and good faith. Nonetheless, I still have serious concerns about this legislation. First and foremost, I'm concerned about the scope of the commission. The events of January 6th did not emerge in a vacuum. Instead, that event is part of a broader wave of violence that has accompanied the increasing coarsening of politics over the past several years and worsening since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Given that many events are inextricably linked, it makes sense to grant any such commission the capability to look more broadly at political violence in this country, including widespread violence of last summer and previous attempts to attack members of this body. After all, the 9-11 Commission was able to look not only at the, the September 11th attacks, but also the broader context out of which those attacks rose. It seems to me that this commission should do the same. Second, at this time, there are several investigations into the events of January 6th that are already underway. Multiple committees in both the House and the Senate held hearings and will continue to hold hearings throughout this year. According to the Washington Post, more than 440 suspects have been charged in connection with the attack, and all of those charged will face legal proceedings that may last for some time. Given those ongoing, uh, those ongoing investigations and the fact that there may well be 100 more investigations underway, I'm concerned that adding another investigation from a commission such as this at this time will only muddy the waters and make both uh, due process and justice harder to reach. Despite these concerns, I again want to thank my good friends, Mr. Katko and Mr. Thompson, for their hard work on this bill, which I hope can be improved further through the legislative process. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. And, and we'll talk about the, uh, the, com the uh, special committee a little later, but I just want to point out that the, the, the point of the committee um, is to look at the January 6th attacks on this capital and on this democracy. Um, it's not a partisan fishing expedition. Um, and um, I, um, yeah, well, I, I, will, I will talk more about that, including my, my, how stunned I am at the statement by the minority leader, which I, I find alarming, um, uh, given all that we've been through, uh, and given the bipartisan nature uh, of the uh, negotiations between Mr. Thompson and Mr. Katko. But, we will put that off uh, to the next panel. I would now um, like to welcome our witnesses uh, to provide testimony in HR 3237, the emergency supplemental to respond to the January 6th Appropriations Act of 2021. Uh, Chairwoman DeLauro and Ranking Member Granger, um, I agree with the Ranking Member, you're two of our favorite people on the Appropriations Committee, uh, and um, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, and without objection, any written materials you submit to rules documents at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. I now recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Chairwoman DeLauro. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and to you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole. Uh, first of all, so thank you so very much for your very kind words, and it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear before the Rules Committee, and I thank the members of the committee. Uh, to discuss the emergency security supplemental to respond to January 6th. Uh, no one needs reminding about the violence of January 6th, the terror that many members and their staff experienced, or the tragedies that have unfolded since. We all mourned for Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick, who died after engaging protesters. And we keep face with the scores of Capitol Police District of Columbia Metropolitan Police and other law enforcement officers who were injured, many in serious life altering ways, 140 officers injured. We also heard stories about how many on the force have struggled with the emotional trauma of January 6th. And we pray for the families of Capitol Police Officer Howie Liebengood and DC Metropolitan Police Department Officer Jeffrey Smith, who both died by suicide in the aftermath. We were instantly taken back to that awful day when on Good Friday, Capitol Police Officer Billy Evans was killed and Officer Ken Shaver was injured when they were attacked at a security checkpoint near the Capitol. Mr. Chairman, it is no understatement to say that our Capitol community is shaken. 
the Congress owes it to the women and men of law enforcement, and indeed everyone who works in or visits our capital, to pay for the costs to recover and rebuild after the insurrection, after our democracy was attacked. We need to act to ensure the safety, security, and health of all who serve in the legislative branch. Beginning the morning after the insurrection, the Appropriations Committee began gathering information to guide this legislation. In late January, we were the first committee to hold a bipartisan briefing with relevant agencies to help identify their needs. I appreciated Ms. Torres and Mr. Uh, uh, Rentschler participation in what members on both sides agreed was an informative and a constructive discussion. And I will be honest here, I'm not quite sure that the uh, ranking member who was at all hearings at all times uh, was, was able to make that hearing. He may have popped in or out, but no reason, but he knows that that briefing uh, took place uh, and uh, what it was about. In the months that follow, the Appropriations Committee has discussed this issue at 12 subcommittee hearings. We've held extensive conversations with uh, security experts in and out of government. And I am so grateful for the work of the six subcommittee chairs of jurisdiction. Congresswoman Lucille Roybal Allard of Homeland Security, Congresswoman Betty McCollum, Defense Congressman Ryan of Ledge Branch, Congresswoman Quigley of Financial Services, Congresswoman Pingree of the uh, 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 Interior Subcommittee, and Congressman Cartwright of the uh, Commerce Justice State uh, uh, Subcommittee. We have also carefully examined the Task Force 1-6 Capital Secure Review led by Retirement Lieutenant General Russell L. Honore and comprised of senior law enforcement experts and retired military leaders. The Capital Security Review provided critical recommendations to address the immediate needs of the Capitol Police and on the physical and policy changes that are necessary and needed to secure the Capitol, members, and employees. Moreover, we have heard from the Capitol Police Inspector General, who identified shortcomings and recommended areas in need of additional resources and incorporated these ideas throughout the legislation. And finally, some of the most important conversations we have had in shaping this legislation were with you, my fellow members. Recognizing the importance of responding quickly, this legislation is narrowly tailored to January 6th and related security needs. We resisted attempts to include extraneous provisions. Mr. Chairman, to briefly summarize, this legislation contains $1.9 billion in emergency supplemental appropriations to respond to the costs incurred because of the tragic events of January 6th, protects the facilities, members, employees, and visitors going forward, and provides for safe and healthy congressional operations. This legislation responds to the direct costs incurred by the attack on the Capitol by reimbursing the National Guard with $521 million and the District of Columbia with $67 million for their response. It provides $44 million for the Capitol Police to cover overtime pay, retention bonuses, equipment replacement, and wellness and trauma support. This includes a provision renaming the Capitol Police Wellness Center in memory of Officer Howie Liebenbrook. To continue prosecuting the hundreds of perpetrators who attacked law enforcement and ransacked the People's House, the legislation provides nearly $40 million to the Department of Justice, as well as an additional smaller reimbursements to agencies like the Federal Bureau of, in of Investigation, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, U.S. Marshal Service, and the Bureau of Prisons. Looking to the future, the legislation strengthens the security of the Capitol complex by hardening windows and doors, constructing security screening vestibules, and installing new cameras at a total cost of $530 million. 
that provides $18 million for specialized training, riot control equipment, body cap cameras for the Capitol Police. And to augment the Capitol Police in future emergencies, this bill appropriates $200 million for a dedicated quick reaction force of National Guard personnel. The legislation also bol bolsters security for members of Congress with dedicated funding for enhanced security and threat assessments, coordinated member travel security, and upgrades to security in district offices. To address security threats in the judicial branch, the legislation provides nearly $183 million for the security at courthouses and for federal judges, many of whom are presiding over trials of January 6th insurrectionists. And finally, it provides funding for reimbursements and the ongoing response to ensure congressional operations are healthy, they're safe amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. I believe there is broad support for these resources since funding for legislate, legislative branch COVID-19 needs was not included in recent legislation. Mr. Chairman, while we will soon establish a commission to investigate the January 6th domestic terrorism attack on the United States Capitol, it is our responsibility to act now, not later. We need to provide the resources necessary to protect the Capitol and those who work and those who visit here. Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, I have talked to the Capitol Police who protect us every day. They cannot wait and we cannot wait. I respectfully request an appropriate rule for fraud consideration of the essential legislation and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you and yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Granger. Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify on this supplemental funding bill to address the security of the Capitol complex and other issues. I wish we were here today to discuss a bipartisan proposal that could easily pass the House and the Senate and be signed into law. Unfortunately, that is not the case. I agree with my distinguished committee chair, Ms. DeLauro, that the events of January 6th exposed serious concerns about the security of the Capitol. I also agree with her that Congress must act to prevent anything like this from ever happening again. For several weeks, Republicans and Democrats on the House and Senate Appropriation Committees had been working in good faith on a funding package. We were not yet in full agreement on some of the costs, many of which are subject to ongoing review by the architect of the Capitol, but we thought we were making progress. Unfortunately, the bipartisan negotiations we were holding with our Senate colleagues on what this bill should contain stall late last week. By choosing to forge ahead with this bill today, I'm concerned that my colleagues are more interested in making headlines instead of headway. Without the support of House and Senate Republicans, this bill is likely headed nowhere fast, I'm afraid. I also know that these issues do not break neatly along party lines. Senate Democrats share some of our concerns. Chairman Leahy has noticed that it is important for the Capitol to remain open and accessible to the public and not feel like a militarized zone, and I agree with him. The proposal for the National Guard to stand up a quick reaction force is one that requires more thought and discussion by all parties. Unfortunately, pushing this bill through the House this week may only serve to delay it from being enacted. I hope we can come back to the table and work together to craft a bill that can pass through both chambers and get signed into law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I support this uh, bill, uh, and I want to thank uh, Chairwoman DeLauro for all of her incredible work and all the uh, time that went into this. Um, and uh, I mean, the question that I get asked most by people is what the hell is taking everybody so long? Why is it taking so long to get a, a bill to, uh, to, to basically provide the resources to protect the Capitol complex uh, that was attacked on January 6th. Why the hell has it taken so long for you guys to get a commission together to invest, investigate what happened on January 6th? Uh, and I, you know, for the life of me, um, you know, I, I don't know uh, why this is, 
at all controversial. Uh, Chairwoman Delora, uh, 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 Mr. Cole talked about uh, a Republican counteroffer. Can you tell us, um, you know, why wasn't that acceptable? Uh, what didn't it address? Well, let, let me just first say that um, um, uh, we proceeded with very good faith negotiations. As I said, uh, there were uh, 12 committee meetings. Uh, there was a general honore, uh, had briefed bipartisan, uh, uh, did a bipartisan briefing, which we all attended. Everyone had the opportunity to ask uh, the, the, uh, uh, the questions. Uh, there were numerous, uh, in addition to the appropriations committees, other committees who were addressing uh, to both Democrats and Republicans um, uh, of the, uh, the issue of January 6th. Um, let me just uh, uh, say to you, and I have, I really literally have documented uh, every day uh, that we uh, either met or were in conversation uh, with our Republican uh, counterparts. Uh, and also with the notion that we were trying to move quickly and that we were looking uh, to May to move forward. I can uh, describe to you the Republican offer, uh, which I have right here in front of me. And the problem with that offer, which is that the defense, defense COVID expenses made up one half of the total of their bill, which was 2.4 billion dollars. I might add, because someone will say, well, why would we not think about defense and COVID? Well, if we just go back very briefly, we will find that the Defense Department has received $10.6 billion in COVID expense reimbursements through the CARES bills or the prior relief bills. So I have, again, in front of me, a document that Really, this the defense COVID uh, 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 cost of this bill, quite frankly, in my view, was not a serious uh, proposal in terms of looking at what we needed to move forward on in terms of securing the Capitol, protecting members, prosecuting those who had uh, breached the Capitol and caused uh, uh, the, the, the damage and the destruction that they did that day. And I would be happy to go through item by item at, at either at this point or another uh, with regard to what that proposal looked like. Uh, and we made that known uh, to our counterparts. We thought we had made real progress on moving forward. Uh, we, uh, we had calls with the four uh, corners and I, I, may, I might add that um, uh, what was a very interesting uh, a comment uh, by the, uh, the uh, minority leader in a letter, again, which I have a copy here right in front of me. He says, um, uh, this was his letter dated May 11th from Leader McCarthy to Speaker Pelosi. Uh, and it was about the Independent Commission, but he says, Finally, as part of the purpose of the commission is to improve the security posture of the United States Capitol complex. The legislation must also require the commission to report findings by November 1st in order to allow sufficient time to be included in an end of the year funding bill to strengthen the security of the Capitol com complex. So there was no desire, no desire to move with uh, uh, focused on January 6th to move with dispatch to secure the Capitol if the minority leader's view was that this could wait until the end of the year, then it really is not understanding the seriousness and the nature of what happened on January 6th and why it is important for us to move with dispatch. We have a Capitol Police today. I stop and talk with them every day, as I am sure most people on this call do, every single day. How are you? How are you doing? Hanging in? How's your family? Scared? When are we going to act? We are acting. And there are others who did not want to act. 
it is our obligation, our responsibility to act, which is what we did with, uh, 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 with conversation and discussion and debate with our House Republican colleagues, our Senate Republican colleagues, uh, and our Senate Democratic colleagues. Thank you uh, very much. Look, this is this is not a game. Um, I was here on January 6th. Many of you were here on January 6th. Um, we saw what happened uh, to this Capitol uh, complex on January 6th, uh, and um, and I, you know, and I, 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 I my, my, I'm still angry at the trauma that was uh, inflicted on our staff, uh, on the people who work here in the Capitol. Um, who the, I, I talked to a, 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 a woman working in the in the coffee shop in the basement of the Capitol, who uh, a couple of days later, who was uh, horrified about about what happened here. Um, clearly, we weren't prepared, um, and we need to be better prepared. That's what this is all about, right? And this can't be politics as usual. This can't be business as usual. This can't be delay, delay, delay. Or it can't be Donald Trump's having a temper tantrum and doesn't want us to talk about these issues, so we're going to do nothing. That's just unacceptable. Uh, you know that that is a uh, an abdication of our responsibility as members of Congress up here. So uh, this is going to go to the Senate. Um, I, I'm sure there'll be some changes and some additions, and we'll and, and we'll come back here. But I mean, if this isn't an urgent matter, then I don't know what the hell is. We all want this place to open up. We want it to be open for our constituents, for tourists, for uh, for visitors. Um, but we want this we want this capital complex to be secure. Uh, I've talked to the mem members of the Capitol Police too, um, who have, are begging us to do more. Well, this is more, uh, and this has been done in a responsible way. So I urge uh, all my colleagues to uh, to su uh, to support this bill. I ask unanimous consent to insert a statement of administration policy in support of HR. 3237. At this time, I turn to the ranking member, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me go first to uh, ranking member Granger. I'm disappointed, as I'm sure you are, ranking member, that the first appearance by the Appropriations Committee before us this year is under these circumstances, where you and the chairwoman are in fundamental disagreement on this legislation. Isn't it true that the supplemental appropriations bills are typically bipartisan? And what happened this time so that the majority felt it necessary to bring a partisan bill to the floor? Mr. Chair, may I speak? Mr. Chair, yes. I, the chair did not bring us into negotiations until a few weeks ago. And we passed one proposal back and there was absolutely no discussion whatsoever. I regret that we're in this position the, the issue is very, very important. It, it is a situation that we should move as fast as we can, but we were completely left out of this, and I think that is a uh, mistake, and uh, we could have worked this out. Thank you. Uh, again, to Ranking Member Granger, you actually mentioned uh, discuss the Senate, and do you have any expectation the Senate's prepared to immediately take up this legislation? We all know that the House by itself can't simply impose its will on the other body. Uh, you have to have agreement with the other body to move, you know, in a hurry. So, uh, and again, you lose this a little bit in your in your comments. But uh, uh, what's your understanding of where the Senate is right now? That's a situation uh, exactly, and I don't think that they're prepared um, to pass this, and we're losing an opportunity, which makes it slower. You know, say. This is the situation, I think, it had we had discussion, which is we, the way we've always worked since I've been on appropriations, uh, and to, to not do that, I think, was a, a, a serious mistake, and I, I regret it. So wouldn't it have been better? And look, we arrived at, in this situation at the end of, of uh, even normal uh, appropriations bills. Uh, you know, we, we have our disagreements here. It doesn't matter who's in the majority. The initial bill tends to be partisan. We all know that the final negotiation, the one that matters, is with the United States Senate. It's out of that negotiation uh, that you uh, have, uh, you know, legislation that can pass both houses and be signed by the president. So, uh, wouldn't it have been better for you and the chair to continue to negotiate the bill, bringing in the senators, see if we can reach an agreement, particularly on a supplemental, because you always want to move a supplemental quickly. 
that's the purpose. It's something out of the norm. That's something we feel like we have to act on right now. So, uh, you know, wouldn't it have been better for uh, the two of you to have negotiated with your counterparts in the United States Senate, come up with a bill, and then be presenting something like that with us today, to us today? I think that would certainly been a better way to handle this. And I think we would move ahead and have something we all agree on and give the support to our police that we uh, we talked about today. And I, I, just, I regret that this is the situation, how it's being, how it's being handled. Yeah, thank you very much. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Torres. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chairwoman DeLauro, um, for your patience and constant uh, updates uh, to all of the members um, of our committee on this issue. On January 6th, the U.S. Capitol went from being the cradle of our demo democracy to what felt like a war zone. It was, I was in the House chamber in the balcony to be more specific, without a way out for 45 minutes, 45 minutes. A place that has always been a sanctuary, a place where we have always, always felt safe. That day, I crawled on my hands and knees in a gas mask, scratching the cornea of my eye in the process. I heard the gunshot that ended a woman's life. I saw barricades go up on the doors around me with any tables and chairs the Capitol Police could find. The sanctity of this body was pierced in a way that was utterly unimaginable. I hope for the sake of this nation, for the sake of future generations, that this will never happen again. And that we ourselves are prepared to answer that call to duty to never allow that to happen again. A Capitol Police officer died that day. And we lost two more since then because of the trauma the day endured was too much to bear. Many people who were in this building from officers to members, staff, the maintenance crew that pick up our trash every day. Those are innocent people. Will carry the scars of this day for the rest of their lives. And while our democracy endured, you know, our purpose here today is to fund the protective measures that take the necessary steps to ensure one of this body's darkest moments will never be repeated again. This emergency security supplemental package pays back the National Guard, the District of Columbia, and other federal agencies for their responses that fateful day. It supports the Capitol Police with overtime pay retention bonuses, equipment replacement, and wellness for the, for the trauma support that they have endured and continue to endure. It also holds the perpetrators who storm these halls accountable and prosecutes them for their crimes. It will find new windows, doors, and security cameras. It will create a dedicated quick reaction force for future security threats. And it will give our heroes, the Capitol Police, who use their own bodies our shield, as their shields, the riot gear and training that they should have had that day. Colleagues, this is, this is the very least that we can do to safeguard our democracy and do right by the men and women who sacrificed so much that day and the innocent bystanders. Whatever headlines you may be fearing already happened on January 6th. That history has already been written. 
I urge each and every one of you to join me in supporting this package. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me just ask, uh, because I've been looking through the looking through the legislative language, and I, I just heard the comment that it repays the National Guard for their participation. Is either to either of our witnesses is that is that correct? Yes, the National Guard. There's five hundred twenty-one million dollars to pay uh, for the uh, operation costs for the Guard deployment uh, throughout from January 6th throughout the capital region from January 6th to May 23rd. Uh, and this was funding that was requested by the Department of Defense. So let me just ask you a question. Are we reimbursing the states from which these National Guard units were deployed or are, are we reimbursing the states for their expenses? No, we are not. Well, is that something that was considered? Um, I will, I will, you know, I don't know that the guard, I don't know that the Department of Defense uh, asked us to deal with, uh, you know, where the folks were coming from, uh, took care of their operations, their pay, et cetera. Um, and this is, uh, uh, you know, it's not a state expense. Uh, this was a, a, a Defense Department expense. So that's what we were doing is to uh, pay the cost to the Defense Department. Well, during... Let me just ask both of you, uh, uh, both of our witnesses, and thank you for being here. But during the hearings on this, what, did, did this subject come up? Were there costs incurred by the states for the deployment of their units to Washington, D.C. For, for the term of their deployment? No, not that should, I know. Should, should we have asked the states if there were expenses that they incurred? Well, since it is not a state expense, it's a Department of Defense expense. But there, there, are, there are state guard units that were deployed. I, I, I'm just asking the question because I don't know the answer, and and, and people pose it to me. Uh, so I thought I would ask of our witnesses. Apparently, though, it didn't it didn't come up in your hearings on this supplemental. Uh, what came up was what the Department of Defense asked for the five hundred and twenty one million dollars. That's what was asked. All right. And we were responsive to it. Let me just ask of, of uh, Representative Granger, Ranking Member Granger, um, you referenced your beginning of your, your comments about uh, uh, that you'd hope for a bipartisan proposal. Uh, do you think that by perhaps opening the process up, we, we, we are the Rules Committee, we are the ones that decide how legislation is brought to the floor, whether it's uh, uh, an open or structured or closed rule, do you think it is possible through the amendment process that we we might uh, we might make this a more bipartisan uh, make might make this a more bipartisan uh, product by uh, by opening up the rules process? So I get, and again, the question to Representative Granger was, do you think we could we could make this a more bipartisan pr uh, product by opening up the rules process, perhaps to a structured rule or even an open rule? I think that would be helpful uh, for it to go to the rules. Look, uh, let me ask you this. Do we, uh, e in either of you, um, do we have a timeline from the architect of the Capitol when we will likely be able to open the building back up to the public because the end of the day, this is the people's house. I'm sorry, as mute and unmute here. Uh, uh, my understanding is, is that uh, we are waiting to get to the deliberation of uh, when we can uh, fully open the Capitol and uh, 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 allow people back in and visitors, uh, et, et cetera. So I don't have a specific timeline uh, for you uh, with regard to that. I, I will um, make a comment on your prior question um, that the Guard is activated not only for state duty, but for federal activities uh, as well. Uh, so uh, the, it's a fe federal status, as I understand it, and the states are fine. So that's, that, that's um, uh, 
recent information. Very well, you can be assured I will ask my state if that is indeed their, their understanding as well. Let, let me just ask you on this, uh, on the quick reaction force that is discussed, is it, is it envisioned that the quick reaction force is, is going to be within the Capitol Police itself, or is that a National Guard quick reaction force? It is with the DC National Guard, and it's, I thought uh, that uh, a General Walker, who was uh, recently appointed to the um, a position of Sergeant at Arms in the House, uh, has uh, recommended that we have such a, uh, have such a force. Uh, and as you know, he was uh, a, a director of the National of, of the Guard uh, prior to taking on uh, this responsibility of this Sergeant at Arms. Uh, in the in the house, uh, yeah, I think I think it was a surprise to a lot of us that there wasn't the ability to quickly respond to an incident at the Capitol. We're not we're not immune from uh, a protest and, and and public demonstration. I mean, it happens all the time. Uh, certainly, the last twenty years or nineteen years that I've been here, there have been multiple times when there's been uh, significant. Uh, um, um, unease across the country, and it has sort of manifested itself in in protests around the Capitol. I uh, apparently was in error in assuming that there was already a provision for protection of the Capitol in times of, of stress or crisis. Uh, did that not exist? Had we not appropriated money for that in the past? Uh, well, I, I would really I, I would even get you the the testimony of that uh, January 26th the briefing that we held on a bipartisan, well, I might add. I, would, I, I appreciate that. I was there at the briefing. And again, I was startled that there wasn't already a provision for quick reaction. Well, but the, the fact was, is that the, 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 the way that it proceeded is that, and no one quite knows to this date why the order wasn't given in a much, uh, you, you know, accelerated time frame uh, to deploy the guard. That was the issue. Uh, as to getting the sign off for deployment of the guard, and it was held up. And again, we do not yet know what the cause of that was in terms of making sure that the guard was there. This this uh, quick reaction uh, of force will act just like the air guard now does for air space. So uh, again, just uh, um, an observation. It seems that uh, some of our attention perhaps could be given to what the Capitol Police is able to provide us in quick reaction because they are the uh, they are the people on the on the front lines if you will that a great that's limit. Trying, yeah, sorry we're trying to address in this very uh, piece of legislation uh, that we need to uh, really to equip the National Guard not in the National Guard with the Capitol Police uh, with um, more of the tools that they need to be able to act. You will also recall on that day, um, the, there was hardly any command and control with regard to the Capitol Police and uh, what their responsibilities or duties and so forth. And quite frankly, uh, uh, and there was just a, a, a this morning on the news uh, that the, the intelligence um, uh, was out there, uh, except it had not been analyzed and nor had intelligence been passed on to the Capitol Police. And we tried yeah. to address those issues. So there were a lot of shortfalls. Uh, what you address is what we try to address uh, in the supplement. I just remember a different time when a president said the buck stops here. I'm just wondering where, where the buck stopped that morning. Why, why, why was there uh, insensitivity to intelligence? Why was there lack of preparation. I heard from a number of people who worked in the Capitol uh, that expressed concern about things that might happen on Wednesday. If it's down to the level of people who work in the Capitol, why was that concern not uh, manifested at the at the upper echelons of, uh, of our power structure here? Representative Crenshaw, let me just ask you a question because our colleague Dan Crenshaw has asked for an amendment to your, your uh, appropriations bill that uh, would require reporting on costs and recommendations related to the United States Capitol Police uh, having their emergency response teams have uh, 
vehicles that they could take home with them so that their ability to respond quickly would be uh, would be enhanced. Uh, it, was that not covered in the in the baseline text of the uh, of, of the supplemental appropriation? It was not addressed, um, and perhaps if it goes to rules, uh, there could be some help there on that. My understanding: we had two hearings from the oh. acting chief of the DC police about a week apart. And the testimony was significantly different the second time it came about what, what happened, when they knew, uh, what the process was. Well, I think that I think our colleague, uh, Representative Crenshaw, has brought up an excellent point, and uh, I will uh, I will look forward to offering that an amendment to the rule, Mr. Chairman, if it's not made as part of the base uh, structure. So, thank you all for your attendance this morning. I'm going to yield back. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Burgess. And I think a lot of the questions you asked will be answered by the uh, commission that uh, we'll be discussing next. Um, and I just wanna say for the record, it's always lovely to hear you talk about open rules because uh, when I look back at the 115th Congress when your party was in charge and you were on the rules committee, you didn't vote for a single open rule. Um, in fact, you voted for more closed rules than any other Congress in history. So, uh, but anyway, I just wanted to point that out for the record. Uh, happy to yield now to Mr. Raskin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Congresswoman Delora, uh, Madam Chair, thank you for your hard work on this legislation. Um, how much of the money is going to actually pay for the expenses of dealing with January 6th itself versus how much of the money is forward looking to protect ourselves against the next violent insur insurrection against the union? The, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. The, the, the majority of the, the funds, and I, I can get you a breakdown, is going for the re reimbursement of funds. Okay. I mean, so I'm looking at um, the breakdown, like the, the money for the National Guard, for DC emergency planning, Capitol Police, Architect of the Capitol, Prosecution Support, Library of Congress. Uh, a lot of that looks like it's backward looking to deal with the cost of January 6th. Is that right? You're saying most of it. I, I, in my head, it looks like it's something like $740 million, something like that. But maybe your staff could, could we'll get, get that. It will get you a precise number. OK. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an extraordinary sum of money that that violent insurrection is costing the people of the United States, right? They unleashed mob violence against the Capitol. They beat up our police officers, hitting them over the heads with flagpoles and spearing people, spraying bear mace in their face. Um, it was a scene of absolute chaos and wreckage. And it's costing us hundreds of millions of dollars. Did you talk about uh, whether the United States has an action in restitution against the organizers and the inciters of this costly attack on the United States. Can we sue? I, I really, I'm, I'm not an attorney, so I don't know, I really don't know the answer to that question, Congressman Rask. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's remarkable to me that we're talking about taking money from the taxpayers to pay hundreds of millions of dollars to pay for this cost of this mayhem, this havoc that was visited upon the Capitol. And we're not talking about suing the people who caused it. You know, Madam Chair, if somebody came and came into your house and wrecked all that beautiful artwork you've got behind you and tore up the place and broke down your doors and smashed your windows and beat people up, yeah, you'd want them prosecuted, but wouldn't you also if, if you've determined who organized it, wouldn't you also want restitution? Because that's costing you a lot of money, right? Yes, yes, indeed. All right, well, I, I hope we don't leave it at this. I mean, I, I don't think our attitude should be, yeah, we're fair game. Anybody who wants to come and beat the hell out of our police officers and smash our windows and trash the place, come and do it. Oh, and we'll, and we'll hit up the taxpayers to pay for your rampage. Mm -hmm. We can pursue that, 
you'd like to pursue. I mean, this is real money, hundreds of millions of dollars that we're having to pay. Now, if somebody comes and ransacks your house and storms your living room and you've got to put in an alarm system for the future and you've got to, you know, connect, uh, you've got to fortify your house and build new windows and so on. All right, maybe, I, I don't know that a court would allow you to charge those people for that going forward just because they, they've changed the, the terms of engagement in the United States. One of my colleagues was puzzled about why the Capitol Police weren't ready for it, and I think we need to look into that too. But certainly, none of us has ever experienced a violent fascist insurrection in the capital of the United States before. That, that's a new thing, right? I mean, you, you, you've been in Congress for a while, Madam Chair. Have we ever experienced anything like this in, in your experience? Not, nothing, not, nothing like this. And I, like Ms. Torres, um, was in the, the gallery uh, that, that day. And um, um, it, it, it was, uh, I quite frankly didn't know when they asked us to, to reach for gas masks um, under the seats uh, in the House chamber that I didn't know we had gas masks in the House chamber, let alone know how to uh, put on a gas mask, told to the evacuate, uh, saw, the, saw the, 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 the smashing of the glass to the chamber doors um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and gunshots. Uh, and gunshots, where we were all asked to drop to the floor, crouched behind uh, the chairs on the perimeter of the. Uh, 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 and I'll just tell you one personal answer. You, 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 you were right about the. The federal government is picking up the responsibility and the reimbursement uh, for uh, the, the costs that uh, insurrectionists, insurrectionists who were incited to come to the Capitol. Uh, to uh, uh, really, and the clarity when you take a look at what the intelligence was that day, the target of that uh, uh, insurrection and overturning our democratic uh, uh, election uh, was the target was the Congress. That's right, uh, you know. Congress, and it was clarity, it was clear. Yeah. Uh, that information, uh, as one of my Republican colleagues said in the briefing, um, uh, 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 that that in January 26th, if we had all of the intelligence, we had the information, uh, and uh, the uh, that then administration did nothing. Right. Well, uh, far far from uh, you know assisting us, not only was there nothing done to help us, but in fact, uh, it's been determined by uh, bicameral majorities, robust bicameral majorities and bipartisan majorities in the House and the Senate as a constitutional fact that then President Donald Trump incited the violent insurrection against us. Bipartisan, bicameral majorities in the House and Senate have determined as a constitutional fact that's exactly what happened. And of course, everyone knows that. I mean, the the... The, the big stop the steal rally to overthrow the election result in 2020 was not called for Georgia, although he did try to browbeat and intimidate the Secretary of State of Georgia. It was not called in Pennsylvania, although he tried to get the Republican legislative leaders in Pennsylvania to overthrow the popular result and just instate a Trump electoral college slate. It wasn't called for California anyway, so it was called for Washington, D.C., and it wasn't called on January 17th or December 20th or some other date. It was called on January 6th, the date when Congress constitutionally had to meet in joint session in order to count the Electoral College votes. And it was called for one hour before that, and then everyone knows, as uh, Congresswoman Cheney, the former chair of the House Republican Conference put it, he assembled the mob, he recruited the mob, he incited the, the mob, he invited the mob, he ignited the mob. The whole thing is due to him, as Congresswoman Cheney bravely put it before she was canceled out uh, a few days ago. It was all due to him. None of it would have happened without him. And so we know that. And now the taxpayers are being forced to pick up hundreds of millions of dollars because he refused to accept the election result in 2020. Is that not what's going on here? The taxpayers are being shaken down for seven or eight hundred million dollars to pay for the rampage. Well, that's an extraordinary thing for me. And 
I, I support us doing that because, because we have a responsibility to defend ourselves. But I hope we don't leave it at that. I hope that there is a restitutionary action undertaken to get the money from the people who unleashed this violence against us. And we know precisely who they were. In terms of all of the money going forward, I support that too, because the Department of Homeland Security, both in this administration and in the last administration, has said that domestic violent extremism, political white supremacy, is the number one terror threat in the country. And we've seen it all over the country in attacks on churches, in attacks on synagogues, in attacks in Walmarts, all over the place. We have seen this domestic violent extremist movement attacking our government, attacking our people. So we've got to defend ourselves and we've got to make this investment. Thank you for your work, Mr. Uh, the, Madam Chair, and I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, you. Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ranking Member Granger, is there anything that hasn't been discussed or would you like to uh, weigh in on anything that, that's been brought up? Uh, well, I certainly will. Uh, the situation before, uh, the speaker before talked about how this happened. I think one of the things that's important for us to realize that this may not be a single event. And for us to have, be prepared for something like this, there's a cost to it. And that's why I wish we were working in a bipartisan way because it's hard to, to, to look at this seriously and come together to make serious decisions about how we go forward. Uh, there have been several hundred people identified because I think they were not aware of their cameras all over the, um, the building they were in. And so we have proof of what people were doing. And there are all sorts of people that were there. If we knew all the people that caused this, the organizations, that would be a different thing. Part of this is to be looking at that and see not only who's responsible, but how we keep it from happening again. And that's very important. I think it's very important that we move together in doing this because um, we owe it to the citizens in our districts and we owe it to the people that keep, um, keep us safe here in, in the capital and how we go forward to, to make sure that we have people there that can, can respond. And then we don't look at this at this as a single incident, but what caused it and how we can prevent it. I think it's very important. Hey, Ranking Member Granger, what about um, you know just the reasonable option of seeing what the commission finds and what their recommendations are, and then coming back and appropriating the money? Do you think that might be a more prudent way to go about this? I do, and I think that would be would be. Uh, a better way to go forward on this because we're putting this together to say what, what actually happened on that day and how did it happen and who are these people, then I think we could have a bill that is more targeted to exactly what we learned. And I think that would be important. So I also have a concern with the, um, the quick reactionary force or quick, quick reaction force. I don't have a problem with the creation of one or having one. I just, uh, I, I just have an issue with it being under the control of the National Guard rather than the Capitol Police. Uh, I just feel that if we have this quick reaction force, we shouldn't have another layer uh, that we have to go through to actually deploy the quick reaction force, which by by the name alone indicates that it's for a quick reaction. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I agree with you in that situation. I think that would be a better way to address this. I do think it's just important that we really know what we're dealing with. We know what uh, we were dealing with that day and also what we're dealing with today and the aftermath of that. Um, and I think that would be very helpful um, in going forward. Thanks, Ranking Member. I really appreciate it with that. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, Chairman McGovern. Um, I, I believe, as the chair suggested, the, the time is long past to address the security needs of the Capitol for something that happened over five months ago. Um, I, and those security needs were shockingly exposed on January 6th. Um, at this point, many of us have participated in multiple hearings on the response to January 6th, 
And it's become painfully clear that there were multiple systemic failures that need to be addressed. You know, on January 6th, the illusion of security in our capital, in the seat of the United States government, was shattered. And not just for the people who serve here and work here, but for those terrorists and extremists and bad actors who seek to attack or damage our government. So this supplemental bill, appropriations bill, deals with many of the issues raised by the response to January 6th attack. Um, you know, we've heard quite a bit now about understaffing and lack of training for the Capitol Police. We've heard about their um, lack of intel capabilities or ability to respond. All those things need to be addressed, as well as reimbursement for National Guard. Um, the largest criminal investigation in our nation's history, which has already yielded over 500 arrests of people who broke into this building, who damaged, um, damaged the Capitol building itself, who attacked officers of the Capitol Police and the Metropolitan Police, people who are still suffering from the traumatic injuries, if not the physical injuries sustained that day. So there is a lot that needs to be addressed with this supplemental bill. Um, and, and it is, as I said, long overdue. Um, I completely agree that part of preventing something like this from happening again is understanding why it occurred. And I believe that the commission, which we're taking up next, will help to do that because, um, you know, unless we have a shared understanding and a shared truth of what happened that day, then this aim for unity and the trust necessary to participate in bipartisan legislation simply isn't going to occur as long as we have a substantial uh, portion of the electorate and even of this body denying the truth of what happened or trying to silence those who would speak the truth then we're not going to be able to get beyond this. So I, I wholly support the supplemental. Um, can I just confirm, uh, Chairwoman DeLauro, that some of the funding in here will go towards making sure that Capitol Police are properly staffed because I, as I understand it, they've been understaffed for some time. And as we heard in hearings last week, they don't have the um, training or the opportunity for training to allow them to address issues such as active shooters in the Capitol or um, mobs trying to overrun the Capitol. Yes, uh, let me, uh, what, we, what, we, what we do in this bill uh, is to get the Capitol Police, their funding to what is the authorized level. And we uh, deal with, um, uh, you know, both physical and mental uh, health issues, equipment issues, training issues, and I might add from the, a prior conversation um, uh, that the U.S. Capitol Police has a civil disturbance unit, and the supplemental provides equipment for that um, as, uh, uh, as, 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 as well. So what we have tried to do is to uh, really buttress uh, and uh, support the Capitol Police uh, to, quite frankly, levels that we have not seen uh, before, uh, given what happened to them, what happened to the absolute, to the Capitol Police Force on January 6th. I might also add um, that it was the Capitol Security Review that made a recommendation for a quick reaction force, because they, they, their view was that there needed to be a dedicated force ready to respond to any incident, just as, as I mentioned before, the D.C., uh, Air National Guard, they have the mission to protect the region's uh, airspace. And if you have a military battalion with personnel in permanent active guard reserve status, that means, what does that mean? They're full-time, not traditional part-time guard personnel. Uh, and that ensures that they are ready and they are able to augment the Capitol Police in case of emergency, something that did not happen on January 6th until so late in the day that it was, you know, they, they were there, but it happened 
be, you know, uh, not in time to do something about the uh, scaling of the walls, breaching the Capitol, smashing windows, beating up Capitol Police, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and everything that, you know, went forward uh, on, on that day. So the Capitol Police and uh, is, uh, their safeguarding is at the center of, of, of what we want to try to do here for, for future protection. Thank you. Thank you. And I've, I've spoken before on the fact that, you know, obviously um, ramping up their intel capabilities um, appears to be a priority given the fact that um, the threats of January 6th were, shall we say, hiding in plain view with the former president having invited a mob to DC. And I mean, um, that is about $100 million if, uh, if, uh, Officer Evans who, you know, it, it, by the vestibule, what we have done is they put in $100 million to secure and strengthen the vestibule so that, you, you know, that you just can't come in and, uh, you know, overrun that portion. If I might add uh, to Congresswoman, uh, to Congressman Raskin, uh, the, the reimbursement funding in the bill is $665 million. Okay. Thank you for that, and, and thank you for your work on this. And, and as always, um, we're extremely grateful to the Capitol Police and the Metro Police who um, you know, saved our democracy on January 6th under the most um, abominable conditions, and, and we're grateful to them every day. Thank you, I yield back. Ms. Fishbach. You need to unmute. You, we can't hear you. There you go. Okay. How are you doing? You know what? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Morelli and then come back to you. Um, and if all else fails, we'll, we'll just open the window and you can scream. All right. All right. Okay, all right. All right, all right. Mr. Morelli. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just want to associate myself with uh, uh, my colleagues who have spoken on our side, and I want to thank Ms. DeLauro uh, for her incredible leadership on this. This is goes to the foundations of our democracy, and uh, so I am strongly in support of the, uh, the proposed rule and the uh, underlying bill, and uh, with that, I'll yield back. <laughs> So uh, we'll try Ms. Fishbach again, and, and then if, if, if we can't get her, we'll go to Mr. Desanye and we'll come back. Uh, All right, you can go. you hear me now? Yes. All yes, right, good, okay. I feel like a sprint commercial. All right, okay. <laughs> but thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was just going to um, ask uh, Chair uh, DeLauro, if, was there some kind of comprehensive uh, assessment or study regarding um, the, the needs, the security needs um, at the Capitol, uh, Capitol campus? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, 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 absolutely. I, the, the, there was the, the task force, a 1-6 Capitol Security Review, which was led by retired Lieutenant General Russell Honore. And that was comprised of <clears throat> senior law enforcement experts and retired <clears throat> military leaders. And so they provided critical recommendations to address the needs of the Capitol Police and, and <clears throat> on the physical and policy changes that are needed to secure the Capitol. Uh, members, employees, um, in addition to that, uh, the Capitol Police Inspector General. And I, I might add, if you read that report, uh, and there was a hearing of, of the House administration uh, committee under Chair Loftgren held a, um, uh, a hearing uh, on the Inspector General's uh, report. Uh, and th that report identified shortcomings. They recommended areas in need of additional resources and uh, incorporated the ideas what we did uh, throughout the, the legislation. And I might add um, that the Inspector General had made recommendations, which in the past, you, you know, uh, uh, may not have been fulfilled, but we tried to uh, uh, hone very, very clear to expert advice 
Uh, and specifically, as I say, the narrow focus was on January, uh, January 6th. Uh, and, but there were, um, and, and like, th this was the other uh, committees uh, that held hearings brought in expert witnesses uh, as, as well to address this issue. Uh, and as the commission will do is to bring in experts uh, to, to, to do the review. But we worked very, very closely um, with the, uh, the security review um, uh, 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 effort led by General Honoré. Well, and, and thank you, because I, I, as I look through the, um, the resolution um, through HR 3237, there's not a lot of detail. Um, there's a lot of money, but not a lot of detail necessarily of where the money is going. Um, and so I, I guess I'm, I'm struggling with this is how we really, do we really know that this is the kind of money or this, these are the amounts they need directed at the right things. And, and I will say there's an awful lot of money um, for COVID um, relief or uh, prevent, prepare for and respond to the coronavirus. So there's a lot of money for that um, in there also. And well, so I'm just concerned about, um, about you know, spending this kind of money. And I absolutely believe we, we should be um, funding our police officers the way we need to. I, I absolutely believe they have a difficult job and I think that uh, they're an important part of our um, of our society, but I'm going to move on, and I'm going to ask. Well, if I can, if I can just respond for one second, Sorry, I'm sorry. if I can, because we sent you, uh, and we sent uh, every member, every member received an emergency security supplemental appropriations act responding to the January sixth uh, insurrection. Mm -hmm. Very detailed summary of, uh, for instance, National Guard for pay and operations costs for guard deployment, capital police uh, response to the January 6th, including 31 million for salaries to backfill overtime expected, 6.9 million for hazard pay, 3.6 for retention bonuses, 3.2 for intelligence division for human and technical resources. So a very well documented of, of a summary of all of the costs um, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, that are there. So I, I commend this uh, to you. If you have not received a copy, I will make sure that you do. And with regard to Ledge Branch, the COVID dollars amount to $171 million of $1.9 uh, uh, billion. So thank you. Well, and, and, um, and, I, and I, think, I think I have the, the sheets that you're referring to, and I understand, that, I mean, I see that on this sheet, but you know, there's uh, the there's a lot of money being spent, and um, like I said, there's also COVID dollars and whatever percentage of it it's it is. Seventy one million for Ledge Branch. It, it, it's and it, and I would be interested in the um, figures that uh, Congressman Raskin asked for about um, uh, how those were broken out. So, but moving on, um, I wanted to ask uh, Ms. Granger. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Burgess had act, asked about the opening, about opening the Capitol, and I'm just wondering if there are any any um, connection to all of these dollars that we're spending on security to opening the opening the Capitol complex back up. Because if we're going to be spending the money, should we not be talking about? And I and I understand that there's no timeline, but is there any kind of connection um, as we spend all these dollars? There is no requirement uh, in this bill. Well, and, and thank you. I would hope that there would be some, that would be the absolute goal and the dollars would be directed in that and um, to that goal. Um, but in addition to that, and um, I, I'm just wondering, um, Ranking Member Granger, if there is, um, you know, Dr. Burgess had talked about um, an open rule and some of the amendments. Um, just wondering, um, are there any that you would like to see discussed by the whole body? You know, given that I, I believe this didn't go through any committee and uh, have a full hearing in a committee. Now, I, I, if I if I'm wrong, I stand corrected. But I'm just wondering if there are any kind of any of those amendments that would that will really could be discussed by the whole body and improve this bill. I I, I would like to see that. I would like to see. Um, more discussion so everyone will be comfortable with this. I think it's important funding. Don't, don't get me wrong, but I think there would be a better bill if it was a 
bipartisan bill. I think it would be a better bill, though, if we did have that study and say, here's what we need. Um, Honoré has, has a distinguished career, and so he has made some suggestions and talked to me, and, but I think that would be very important. I don't want to go on forever, but I do think there's a time that we should be looking at this carefully, and particularly the, the amount. Uh, regarding the police, there, you know, there, was a, there was a lag time of, it looks like three days, when some evidence that something like this was happening, going to happen, and then um, nothing was done with that. Well, and thank you, Brian Camper. I just, I, I just, I think that this is such an important issue, and the money being spent that we should have, um, you know, amendments from the minority and discussion from the minority, and um, and full and open discussion um, on on the floor or whether or if it had gone through committee. But, um, but I thank you um, for your work on it, ranking member, and um, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just uh, one question for Chair DeLauro. Um, my understanding from the beginning of um, your testimony was that this um, emergency security supplemental went through multiple subcommittees. Uh, could you tell me, uh, could you just recite again the subcommittees that looked at um, the amounts and the needs? Yes. I'm ha happy to do that. Thank you. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, shortly after we, we, be we began to move on the Appropriations Committee uh, right after the 6th, at the end of, of uh, J January, in uh, an absolutely bipartisan, um, uh, as a matter of fact, it was a briefing. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest, the, the uh, uh, minority asked it not to be uh, a, a hearing, but rather a briefing uh, without press. Uh, and uh, which I said a uh, fine too. And what we did was uh, we asked all of the, the chairs of the subcommittees of jurisdiction, those, the several that I mentioned, Ledge Branch, Defense, Homeland Security, Park, et cetera. Uh, the chair and the ranking member uh, 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 had the opportunity. We brought in uh, all of the uh, 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 agencies uh, uh, to be able to ask uh, 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 questions and to get information. Not only was it just the six subcommittees, but the uh, the the briefing again, and it was a closed briefing, as I say, because um, uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle did not want to have a hearing, uh, a public hearing, um, and so I said fine, and uh, just because I wanted to get the information out uh, up to us, because we had to make the decisions, and uh, so, but the entire appropriations committee. I think we went for almost three hours that day because uh, every member of the entire appropriations committee had an opportunity to ask questions of the 10 agencies that we brought before us. Uh, uh, subsequent to that, uh, the, the 12 of the, uh, uh, again, of the other subcommittees each had uh, their individual uh, hearings. Uh, I think Ledge Branch may have had three or four hearings. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ledge Branch had eight hearings where this was discussed. And the, again, the other subcommittees uh, had uh, 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 hearings as well. They brought in security experts who were in government and out of government uh, to uh, uh, ask the questions, to address the, um, uh, the, the issues, and to make recommendations. We always asked to make recommendations because the view was, how do we go forward with this so that in fact, it doesn't happen again. I might also add that the uh, 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 House administration uh, under Chair uh, Lofgren has had a number of hearings, uh, including uh, most recently, uh, I believe with the Inspector uh, General uh, on, this, on this issue. Uh, again, oversight has had uh, uh, under Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Maloney had a, a hearing on this issue. So it wasn't just the Appropriations Committee and the 12 subcommittees, but a variety of other of our uh, standing uh, committees uh, that took up this issue uh, and to get some understanding of what happened. I say that in addition to, as I mentioned already, the security review 
out of the recommendations that came from General Honore and General Honore briefed in a bipartisan way, all of the members answered questions and talked about recommendations that should be made. So there was in essence a very full airing of the what occurred, why it occurred, what we could do going forward uh, to, to prevent it and to uh, uh, take look at what, what we needed to prevent it, including Capitol Police, uh, prosecution of the insurrectionists, um, uh, uh, mental health uh, and well-being, equipment, training, intelligence gathering, uh, et cetera. So. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to thank you for all this hard work and leadership. And clearly, the sooner we move this bill, the better in order to make sure that all of us are secure. And thank, with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Goose. Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, Ms. Granger. Yes. May I just say, uh, to make everything very clear, the the all the meetings that were held were excellent. The presentations were were important. There was more higher attendance at that than anything I think that I have been involved in since I've been in Congress. But I do want to make sure that things are straightforward. And uh, the committee minority did not ask stop having an open hearing. The committee had not been organized at that time, so we had the hearing that we had to have. And that was, and that's how it happened. We did not ask for it, but I do want to make sure that people know there was a, a number of meetings held and uh, and wonderful attendance because because all the Congress, Democrats and Republicans, are very concerned about this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Mr. DeGoose. Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for this panel? Hearing none, I want to thank uh, both Chairwoman DeLauro and Ranking Member Granger for their participation. You are now dismissed. Uh, we, will hear, uh, we will hear any amendment testimony on um, H.R. 3237 at the end of this hearing. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, I would now like to call up our next panel to testify on H.R. 3233, the National Commission to Investigate the uh, January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member <coughs> we're delighted that you are here. Without objection, any written materials you submit to rules, documents, at mail.house.gov before the conclusion of this hearing will be entered into the record. And I, I um, before I yield to you, I, I just, um, I just want to, I, I, I just want to say something here. So I, I just um, received the um, right before this hearing the my leader's statement in opposition. Um, to this commission. Um, we, we, we just heard from some of my Republican colleagues on the Rules Committee about the previous bill we just discussed about how they wish it had been more bipartisan. Um, I want to thank both Chairman Thompson and Ranking Member Katko for actually working together on a, on a bipartisan bill. Uh, but I have to tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the minority leader statement and I'm, a, I'm pissed, to be honest with you. Uh, because I'm also looking at the letters that he sent to the speaker uh, throughout this process, um, expressing concern over provisions uh, that he wanted to be addressed. And both Mr. Thompson and Mr. Katko appear to have addressed every single one of his uh, concerns. Equal distribution between Democrats and Republicans on the commission. Um, even on the issue of subpoena power. Uh, both of you worked out a, a, a deal um, that responds to his concern. I may go right down the, the list. I think the only thing that uh, there's a difference is that he wanted uh, uh, the report to be issued on November 1st. Uh, your uh, bill says December 31st, and I, and I think probably that's a smart move simply because it's taken a while to get to this point. And so I guess what's frustrating to me is that this doesn't seem to be a disagreement over substance or over policy. Um, but I do think this is an issue of character uh, and this is an issue of fitness 
uh, to lead. I really do. And, you know, as somebody who was here on January 6th, who was the last person off the House floor, and who walked into the Speaker's Gallery and saw these rioters smashing the, uh, the windows uh, on the doors, uh, seeing the hate in their eyes, seeing people walking around this, on, on video after that, walking around this Capitol with Confederate flags and with anti-Semitic uh, T-shirts. I mean, and, and, and then fast forward today where we have some members of Congress who are basically saying that what happened, what we all experienced, what we saw didn't really happen. I mean, enough. Now, I assume what happened is Trump got wind that we were doing this and called up the minority leader and said, I don't like it. And so that's what we got this um, opposition pr uh, press release. But I'm gonna tell you, if there's anybody in this chamber who doesn't believe that it's important to get to the truth about what happened on the 6th, or who doesn't, or who wants to make believe that what happened on the 6th didn't happen on the 6th, that it was like a, a typical tourist day on the Capitol, they are not fit to serve in this chamber. And I've had it. I, I mean, I, 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 have, I talked earlier about talking to staff members, talking to people, cap, talking to the Capitol Police, talking to people who work in the cafeteria who are traumatized by the attack on this chamber. I mean, this was, the vice president of the United States was a target. And yet, in a bipartisan way, Mr. Thompson and Mr. Katko come together and bring us a, a finished product that should enjoy the support of every single member of this chamber and the top leader of the Republican Party comes out and says, I can't do it, can't, can't support it. I mean, I, it, it, is, it is pathetic. And I, and, and I, you know, I'm sorry for the preventing, but, you know, I'm worried about this institution um, in the long term. I'm worried about this country and about the integrity of our democracy and our political institutions. People have to stand up and do what's right. People have to stand up and, and for the truth. Um, and one way to do that uh, is to support what these two gentlemen are, are bringing before us. So with that, let me yield to Mr. Thompson for any um, his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I begin, let me acknowledge how strange it's to be with all of you and not have our dear colleague Mr. Hastings here with us. He was a good friend, and I have to say, whenever I came to Ruse, I never ceased to be impressed with his compassion, intellect, and his wit. And he would use more colorful language than I just used. <laughs> no question about it. Uh, turning to H.R. 3233, January 6th was a day of trauma and tragedy that continues to cast a long shadow on the nation. On that day, Americans witnessed their fellow Americans attacking the citadel of democracy, the United States Capitol. On February 4th, the committee held a hearing titled Examining the Domestic Terrorism Threat in the Wake of the Attack on the United States Capitol, where receiving testimony regarding the attack and how the circumstances demanded a bipartisan investigation by counterterrorism experts. Today, uh, nearly five months after the attack, there are still many unanswered questions about the events of that day that need to be answered to prevent future attacks. And there is growing recognition that Congress needs to look outside of these hallowed walls to get those answers. We need to do as we did after the devastating attacks of September 11th and stand up a bipartisan commission to investigate the facts and causes of the attack. It's no accident that H.R. 3233 closely mirrors the legislation that authorized the 9-11 Commission. For almost two decades, the 9-11 Commission has been viewed as the gold standard for how national security leaders 
come together patriotically in a bipartisan way to make America more secure. The events of January 6th demand that we, as a Congress, rise against the, again to the occasion and display the same kind of patriotism and bipartisanship that resulted in the establishment of the 9-11 Commission. To that end, I'm pleased to be joined by my partner on the Homeland Security Committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Katko. Together, we collaborated to develop H.R. 3233, a bill to establish a 10-member bipartisan commission to investigate this attack. The commission will include experts in relevant fields who are not currently serving in government. It encourages the appointment of experts in a broad range of fields, from law enforcement and intelligence to cybersecurity and civil liberties. With respect to scope, like the 9-11 Commission, whose mandate was to investigate the circumstances surrounding the 9-11 attacks, this commission is charged with investigating the facts and circumstances surrounding the January 6th attack. I understand that some would like to see this inquiry expanded to investigate matters far removed from the events of that day. To those folk, I would say this commission's mandate is very intentionally focused on the largest attack on our capital since the British troops set fire to a building in the summer of 1814. That attack was by far a hostile foreign power takeover. This attack involved too far and which did not go far enough. We all must be thankful that our nation has not experienced an attack of this scale on our soil in nearly two decades that have passed. I urge the Rules Committee to approve a closed rule on this measure and allow the House to take an up and down vote on this legislation in a timely manner. And I thank the panel for their attention. I welcome any questions, and I yield back. Thank you very much, and uh, we're delighted to welcome Mr. Katko. Thank you for your efforts on this, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, before I start, I do want to lament also the absence of Elsie Hastings. Uh, you may not know, but every day on the floor of the House, I would walk in and we would compare socks to see whose was more brighter, brighter and get more garish. And uh, I often won, but he gave me a good run for my money. And so in honor of him today, I have a very funky pair of socks on that some would say are very ugly, but uh, I'm doing them in honor of Elsie. So uh, Chairman McGovern, rank, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the committee, I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify on H.R. 3233, the National Commission to Investigate the January 6th Attack on the United States Capitol Complex Act. This year, we will observe the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks on September 11th of 2001, an attack where I lost many of my friends. It will serve as a sober reminder of the fragility of our security and resilience of our democracy. After the terror attacks on 9-11, Congress recognized the importance of establishing a bipartisan commission to investigate those heinous acts. Out of the highly respected 9-11 commission came many concrete recommendations that were later enacted into law. These critical reforms greatly improved our homeland security enterprise intelligence collection, and information sharing, among others. But we still have work to do. The security breach that took place at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th was unacceptable and tragic. It was a major breakdown in information sharing and preparedness, much like the shortfalls that existed prior to 9-11. Unfortunately, we know the Capitol remains a target for extremists of all ideologies, as we also witnessed during the April 2nd vehicle attack at the Capitol that took a Capitol Police officer's life. H.R. 3233 would create an independent, bipartisan commission to investigate and provide findings and recommendations on the January 6th attack, including information sharing gaps, decision making, and other bureaucratic failures, as well as security vulnerabilities as a whole in the Capitol complex. Modeled after the 9-11 Commission, this bill creates a 10-member panel with five commissioners appointed by each party and equal subpoena authority. Appointed commissioners who cannot be current government employees must have significant experience in at least two of the following areas, government service, law enforcement, civil rights, civil liberties and privacy, the armed forces, intelligence, 
Counterterrorism, cybersecurity, technology, and law it has nothing to do with which party you're in. It has to do with your qualifications. The commission's report, which must be agreed upon by a majority of commissioners, will include findings and recommendations to prevent future attacks on our democratic institutions and improve the security of the Capitol. The December 2020 deadline allows for a much shorter timeline than originally proposed, and for good reason. The American people and the Capitol Police deserve answers and improvements as soon as possible to ensure nothing like this ever happens again. As I have called for since the days just after the attack, an independent 9-11 style review is critical for removing the politics surrounding January 6th. We all know there's a lot of politics surrounding January 6th. And for focusing solely on the facts and circumstances of the security breach at the Capitol, as well, there, as well as other instances of violence relevant to such a review. I can't state this more plainly enough. This is about facts. It's not about partisan politics. It's about making the Capitol Police complex stronger. It's about making the Capitol safer. And it's about making the Capitol Police Department our office officers, which by admission is a very dysfunctional group right now with 92% of their members having no confidence in their leadership, gonna make them better. We have to make them better. We owe it to the line people who risk their lives if, to protect us every single day. I wanna thank the strong partnership with Chairman Thompson. In short, he's a good man and he's a fair man and he wants to do the right thing and he did the right thing here. We were able to rise above the politics and turn the initial partisan proposal into a reasonable nonpartisan bill. Now, HR 3233 is nearly identical to the origin, original commission bill, HR 275, that Ranking Member Davis, Comer, and I, along with 28 other Republican co-sponsors, introduced on January 13th, six days after the attack. I can't say enough how much I appreciate Chairman Thompson's robust collaboration and strong commitment to working together on this effort. The American people expect Congress to put partisanship aside for the sake of our homeland security. That is exactly what this bill does. This is exactly what Chairman Thompson and I did, and I'm very proud of it. And for that, uh, I'll take any questions you have, and I yield back. Thank you very much. I want to thank both of you. Um, and um, you know, and I, and again, I look forward to supporting the the the, uh, the bill when it comes to the floor. Um, and look, um, I think you did everything that um, reasonable people would expect you to do, and that is to reach an agreement here. Um, uh, to uh, come up with a, a proposal that is nonpartisan, uh, again, very much all after the 9-11 Commission, uh, to establish the truth. Uh, so you did, you did everything everybody expected you to do, except some people expected you to fail. Some people expected that you would not work in a bipartisan manner. Some people expected you would not, uh, or maybe some people were hoping uh, you would not uh, come up with a, uh, a, a bill like the one you came up with, um, and um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at. Um, I mean, I'm li listening to some of the all of a sudden criticism of your work. Um, one was that um, somehow this would interfere with the ongoing judicial proceedings, and I, I'm, I'm looking at the bill here, um, and if I'm reading this correctly, it says that you're to examine and evaluate evidence developed by relevant federal, state, and local governmental agencies. In a, in a manner that is respectful of ongoing law enforcement activities and investigations regarding the domestic terrorist attack upon the Capitol, regarding the facts and circumstances surrounding such terrorist attack and targeted violence and domestic terrorism relevant uh, to such a, such terrorist attack. And um, I also want to put in the, in the record a letter from over 140 former national security, military, and elected officials uh, calling on Congress to. Uh, Created bipartisan uh, one six commission, but uh, in that in the in their letter they talk about uh, in the wake of September 11th, the administration and Congress jointly acknowledged that the attack causes were complex, and that an independent and well <coughs> commission was an essential tool to aid the federal government. Congressional inquiries, law enforcement activities, and national commission not only worked in parallel but critically complemented each other's necessary work. I, I just say to ask both of you, I mean, can you respond to the, to the questions that, that some have raised that somehow this will interfere with important ongoing investigations or work? Uh, I'd be happy to take that if you, if you like. I've, yeah. I was in law enforcement for 20 years before I was a 
in Congress and um, criminal investigations always reign supreme and there are safeguards built into the system. But in order to really um, uh, look, at, look at that allegation or that, that, that position, think back to 9-11 commission. They were full bore investigating what happened after the commission. There was prosecutions that happened. There were things that happened afterwards, investigations all over the country. There were subpoenas everywhere. There was a worldwide search for the perpetrators that survived that attack, and they were brought to justice. And the commission did not follow up any of that uh, when, when they were doing theirs. And I see the parallel here being very similar. Like you said, in the bill itself, there is reference to uh, acknowledging those, those, those investigations and prosecutions and not interfering with them. But there's procedural safeguards that ensure that for sure, including the Fifth Amendment. But in, on top of that, you have uh, a precedent from the 9-11 Commission whether these people that aren't going to be on this commission will be able to work around those constraints. And I don't view them as constraints at all because really what we're looking at is, in my opinion, more important than anything is, how did, how did this happen? How did we fail to act on the intelligence we knew was there? How were we not ready at the Capitol? And why in God's name did we put these poor Capitol Hill police officers in an unwinnable situation where 140 of them were injured with along with uh, Metropolitan Police officers? That's the real nub of this. It's not a political considerations or the people being held accountable. We're, we're, not, a, we're not a criminal investigatory body. We're a body to try and make the Capitol safer and make the Capitol Police Department much, much, much better and to find out what help they need going forward. That's how I see it. I yield back. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, sure. Sure. the criminal justice system uh, is working. Those 458 uh, individuals who are being charged uh, criminally uh, should be. Uh, we are not in that process. But more importantly, uh, we have to look forward in anticipation of what might happen again. And part of this commission challenge is to look at the facts and circumstances that got us to January 6th and to the extent practicable, uh, try to alleviate that. So we're not in the way. Uh, one of the sayings, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. And that commission uh, clearly can do its work and not interfere with any of the prosecutions ongoing. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, again, I, I want to commend uh, uh, Chairman Thompson and, and uh, Ranking Member Katko for for their work. And I, again, I, I just I go back to my my original remarks. So this is this is what really is frustrating to me uh, at this moment because I do think this is uh, given the severity of what happened on uh, January sixth. This is this is a time when everybody should be should come together. And I. Um, and I, again, I'm looking at um, Republican leader McCarthy's letter to Speaker Pelosi um, and the things that he's asking for, an equal 5-5 ratio in appointments by Democrats and Republicans, uh, co-equal subpoena power for chair and vice chair of the commission, no inclusion of findings uh, or other predetermined conclusions, which ultimately should be rendered by the commission itself. Um, I mean, it's like mission accomplished. Um, what am I missing here? And I and I say this um, because, you know, um, you know, many of us uh, believe in in bipartisanship, but if you, if if you end up engaging in the kind of negotiations that you both successfully engaged in, and the response is no then what's the motivation uh, to engage in bipartisan negotiations? Why? Why, why, is, there, why is there opposition to this? Um, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm uh, you, know, um, you know, Mr. Katko, what, what's missing here um, that's so substantive and so big a deal that, um, it, it would compel people to say, oppose it. Listen, I re absolutely respect my colleagues' uh, decisions to take a different point of view. I mean, uh, politics is not uh, always about everybody agreeing. Uh, it's oftentimes about agreeing to disagree, and that's what we're doing here. And 
Uh, I'm just proud of the fact that there's going to be some Republican support for it, a considerable, considerable amount, I hope. Uh, but regardless, I just know that in my heart, that from what I see from my mate, my perch uh, with Benny on top of the Homeland Security Committee, that for us to lead on this is, is important, and that's what we're doing. Well, there's no question, uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. that, uh, that was give and take. Uh, we really want the bipartisan nature of this commission to be the, the gold standard for how we go forward. We made every effort. Uh, in all reality, I gave more to try to make this work. And, and you can see from the documentation uh, that that's what I did because I've been on the Homeland Security Committee ever since it was a select committee. I know the importance of what this commission means to the security of this country. So it's important that Democrats and Republicans put aside the partisan uh, definition, because generally, when the bad people show up, Mr. Chairman, they don't ask party affiliation. Right. They just want to hurt Americans. When those individuals attacked the Capitol, they came for the vice president, who was a Republican. They came for the speaker, who was a Democrat. You know, they came for what we represent as a nation. And I think that's what we have to defend by having this commission uh, front and center and providing advice and counsel to Congress. No, and I appreciate that, uh, Chairman Thompson. And I, I, I've sat in on many of the chairman's meetings and leadership meetings uh, with you. And I know that uh, there are some uh, on our side who was like, you know, why give this and why give that? Or why should we do this? Or why should we do that? And I'm sure the Republicans had the same conversations on their side. Uh, but both of you, uh, Chairman Thompson and uh, Ranking Member Katko, actually came together and, and uh, put this institution and put this country first. And I'm grateful. And I'm just, and again, I I, 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 I trust that there'll be, hopefully there'll be a strong bipartisan vote on this. But again, I am a little dismayed with the, the minority leader's statement. I, I'm, I'm reading a quote now from, uh, that appeared in Politico uh, from a Republican uh, aide uh, who described the bind that the um, minority leader was in. He said, he, I quote him, he says, this is a Republican aide. I think Kevin was hoping that the Democrats would never agree to our request. That way the commission would be partisan and we can all vote no and say it's a, it's a sham operation because he knows Trump is gonna lose his mind over this commission. And, I, I, and it's just so disheartening and disturbing to read that given what we all saw. Um, and given the fact that we have some colleagues who are denying that we all experienced even happened. So I, anyway, I, look, I don't, I've, I've said enough. I just want to, I, I want you both to know how much respect I have for you. Um, and I think um, that uh, the American people are grateful uh, that, um, that you're doing the right thing. And uh, these experts, not politicians, uh, will I issue a report, um, you know, uh, for history. Um, that hopefully will inform us in terms of how we should proceed, but also make sure the historical record is accurate. Uh, with that, I yield to the, uh, my ranking member, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, begin by uh, echoing your uh, praise for both these two members. Uh, I think that uh, you both did work together in very good faith, and I think it is important that you came together with an agreement, and I agree with the chairman uh, of the committee uh, that uh, you you gave a lot, Mr. Chairman, absolutely. And I agree with my good friend from New York that he got a lot. So let's start with that. Uh, and uh, while there's some questions, I have some questions, I'm, I'm going to give you both an opportunity to answer them. It doesn't change my fact that or the fact that I admire both of you for working so well together. And I think uh, the product that you're presenting to us is far superior to the product that you began to work with, far superior. You'd both be commended for that. Let me start, uh, obviously on our side, uh, or for see, some members, there is concern about scope. Uh, that'd be the first question I would ask. And 
uh, 9-11 Commission did have pretty broad scope. I mean, it dealt with, uh, went back and looked at everything from the attack on the embassies to uh, the uh, attack on the USS Cole, no relation. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there's a pretty broad parameter. As I understand it, this is a much narrower focus. Six amendments, uh, you know, that deal with everything from the, the shooting at the baseball field to uh, we had a wave of violence last year. Is this part of that in a broader sense? I frankly would argue that it is. Uh, uh, and then, um, uh, you know, the, the Good Friday shooting incident that we had uh, as well. Are those things appropriate to, and I'll, I'll start with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and then move to uh, the ranking member. Are those things things that would be considered by this commission or would be appropriate to consider in your opinion? Well, let me just say, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, the, the scope of the committee is to look at the circumstances and facts surrounding uh, January 6th. If the commission uh, wanted to, uh, they could, but it's clearly directed at January 6th. Uh, we have, in good faith, uh, met Republicans, uh, I think more than halfway on everything that's been said so far. So to try to, at the last minute, to stretch beyond January 6th uh, is not the good faith that I had anticipated uh, this commission being about. So I would say uh, there's still potential to look at other things, but clearly if you saw, like every other American, what went on on January 6th, uh, you would be, and I know you are, quite upset at what went on, how it happened, and, and the fact that uh, Mr. Ranking Member, Normally, we'd have school children here uh, right now throughout the summer looking at the Capitol, uh, brag tourists bragging about uh, how we as a country uh, have stood for so long, end of the year, with a product that we can embrace so that we can never, ever be challenged like we've been uh, on January 6th. Mr. Chairman, before I go to Mr. Katko to give him a chance to respond, I share your anger. Uh, Mr. Reschenthal and I may well have been the last two members out of the Capitol since we were barricaded in the Minority Rules Office until 3.40 or something like that. So uh, with, with uh, these folks beating at the door on occasion. So uh, believe me, I understand exactly what you're saying and agree with it wholeheartedly. Uh, I do think... Uh, uh, when I'm asking a question, I hope you don't regard it as bad faith because it's certainly not meant to be. This is my first chance to participate in forming, and that's the true with other members that have offered amendments. So while you two have come to an agreement, and I respect that, and I do think you worked well together, and I do think you significantly improved the body, with all due respect, you're not the last decision makers or the only here. Other members get the opportunity to offer amendments raise questions and express concerns. So that's what we're doing here. And that's what I'm about. And I say that with no disrespect to you, no disrespect to my friend, Mr. Castro. I think you both did a good job. But I also don't think uh, the 9-11 Commission, you know, sprang from a couple of negotiations. There was a lot of interplay between members and frankly, between the two bodies. And that body that we're all praising, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, still has critics to this day, although I think, like you, it did a good job. I think it's did an important work for the country. Uh, but there was a lot of contention around that body, too. So I see what we're going through as part of the normal process of how you get to uh, a, uh, a body that everybody will, will uh, uh, you know, have the confidence in that, that frankly, I have in you and Mr. Mr. Catco. So with that, uh, I don't want to cut you off. If you want to respond to that, Mr. Chairman, feel free. Well, you know, you had the luxury of being in one of the leadership offices. I was in the gallery <laughs> on uh, January 6th for quite a while uh, with the gas mask and a lot of other things. And I also led out through the stairwell 
and put over in Longworth 1100 uh, for a couple of hours with people not wearing masks and too many people. Uh, it was a horrible situation. So most of us have uh, our own story about January 6th. I'm trying to make sure that we make a positive result from what occurred uh, by creating these commissions, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, so we can get beyond uh, the poor play. Uh, we entertain the Republican leadership uh, on this uh, effort because we weren't trying to play gotcha. We wanted to get it right. So uh, we have the numbers to pass it without a single Republican, but that doesn't get us to where we need to be. And so uh, the minority leaders <coughs> in this minute uh, uh, effort to, I think, sabotage the whole effort uh, is disingenuous because those of us who negotiated this did it in good faith. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I said, I don't have any doubt about that whatsoever. And I think the product is considerably better than the one that you began with. Uh, although I will correct you on one front. If you think the minority rules office is the leadership office, come down and see us sometime. There's no security there. Uh, and that was no fun place to be either. And I went through uh, exactly the same tunnels probably that you did to get to that same a location 1100 to Longworth that you did and spent several hours there as well. So, yeah, I just make that point for the record. Uh, what I'm asking is the scope question, and Mr. Katko, I'm going to give you a chance to respond. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with my colleague as to his interpretation of it. The, the bill focuses the commission on the January 6th Capitol attack, as well as targeted violence and domestic terrorism related to that attack which could include things outside of January 6th. It gives the commission that flexibility. How much that commission will uh, exercise that flexibility, that depends on the commissioners, but that's the way the bill is written, and I, I agree with my colleague in that regard. Okay. Let me ask you a second question, and you both spent a good deal of time talking about, uh, uh, you know, we obviously have, and I respect uh, uh, both of your backgrounds and your thought about this, particularly yours, Mr. Gatko, because you were in law enforcement. We do have lots of other investigations going on. Uh, a lot of them we don't know much about, honestly, and probably shouldn't know anything about at this stage. Uh, so we, we know about the 458 that uh, the chairman mentioned. Uh, we don't know about an estimated up to another 100. Uh, there's also the concern, and I would actually flip this question a little bit, and I asked you this just as a layman. I'm very interested. I'm going to start with Mr. Katko and then give uh, the chairman uh, Thompson a chance to respond as well. Um, I worry, you know, I, I actually went back and looked a lot at the 9-11 commission uh, and the time frame, and uh, it was 14 months between the event and the beginning of the 9-11 commission. Uh, and there was probably a lot of information that emerged in that time frame that was helpful to the 9-11 commission. So I, you know, there is always the question of will you inadvertently uh, get in the way of an investigation. But I think there's also the flip side of that. With those investigations, once the case was prosecuted, provide the, com the commission with additional information. In other words, are we moving too soon? Uh, uh, and should we delay a lot? Was any thought given to that? And I'm curious about, particularly Mr. Tecco, your thought about that. Would these prosecutions, uh, uh, you know, once they're public and once verdicts have been reached, actually provide information that could be useful uh, and that might otherwise be missed. Yeah, well, um, my opinion to that is, first of all, the overarching uh, observation is a couple of things. Number one, this it has no criminal imprimatur on it, so it has nothing to do with criminal investigations. This has to do with what is the security posture at the House? Is it adequate? And what were the failures that happened on January 6th? And what do we need to make the Capitol stronger going forward and safer and the Capitol Hill police infinitely better going forward? So um, whether or not someone at the prosecutor decides to say that uh, someone else was involved with me when I crashed the Capitol, 
I'm not sure is going to be that relevant to what we're looking at. We know what happened. We, and this is much more of a finite observation than a 9-11 commission. The 9-11 commission looked at not the security matrix and security posture of one building and one department. They looked at the security posture and the security matrix nationwide of an entire country and indeed the entire world, dealing with an international menace being uh, uh, Islamic terrorism in the United States. So it was a much more difficult thing because you look not at just the Capitol Hill Police, you looked at the FBI, you looked at the uh, CIA, you looked at uh, all the defense agencies, all the international uh, intelligence organizations, Interpol, everything. It was a much more complex thing. So the, what I like about this commission bill is laser focused on just what I said. And because of that, I think the timing is important. We can't wait to make this place safer. We need to do it now because people, especially bad guys in the international criminal community, see a weakness in the United States, they tend to exploit it. And we can't wait to try and uh, make this safer in hopes that somebody down the road that's maybe subject to a criminal investigation decides to cooperate and tell us more. I really do think we know what happened. And I really do think that uh, if we act now and uh, we act in an expedited manner, which I think we can, it's not going to take long to figure out what the failings were at the leadership level at the Capitol Hill Police and what the failings were with them uh, not acting on actionable intelligence that they should have acted upon. I, mean, I think it's a much more finite uh, inquiry, and therefore I think the timing is right, and I think the, the, the timetable is right to get this done and get this done in an effective manner. Chairman Thompson, I certainly want to give you a chance to weigh in. Well, there's no question, that, as I said earlier, we're not uh, addressing the, the criminal intent uh, and involving any interaction with that proceeding. Uh, but from an oversight standpoint, uh, a lot of the information from the honorary uh, committee report from government reform and oversight, House administration, there are a number of, of things that have gone on after January 6th. But what we have to do now is laser focus uh, from this committee, committee's mission's perspective the opportunity uh, to get it right. And that's why the expert that we've recommended in terms of skills is absolutely essential for the success of this commission. And then once it's put together, uh, properly staffed and resourced, we get out of the way and wait for the December 31 report. And so that's the spirit in which uh, it was developed and that's the spirit in which uh, Ranking Member Catco and myself come before Rules Committee today. Uh, one more question. I'm curious if, uh, and this certainly isn't a requirement to, for us to act as a body, but I'm just curious if you have either of you had any discussions with the Senate? Uh, you know, what's your assessment of, I mean, clearly for this thing to become law, it has to pass both bodies and you know, I'm just curious if that process has begun and, uh, you know, you have any sense of what the response is over there. Mr. Chairman, I'll start with you and then I'll move to the ranking member for a response. Well, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, I learned a long time ago not to count your chickens before they hatch. <laughs> so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> even, even, though I'm, said, Mr. Chairman. even though I'm not a farmer, I totally agree. <laughs> Well, does that mean you haven't had any discussions? And again, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to. I'm just curious. All right, I, we have not to my knowledge, not not in depth. No. Okay, and and that's that's fair enough. Uh, let me see if I had anything else there. No, I think that uh, covers it, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole, Ms. Torres. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. We've spoken about the horrors that occurred on January 6th, and we know what we experienced. We know that the fear of crawling across the House chamber as an armed mob broke windows, stormed the halls, and used our American flag to beat our officers. We know the terror our families felt while they watched the attack. But there is a lot that we still don't know. 
there are a lot of answers we don't have yet. And that is why a national commission to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol Complex Act is so important. This commission will be tasked with evaluating the evidence and causes of the attack, as well as issuing a report with recommendations to protect from future attacks. This, com this commission is essential to moving forward. This was an attack on our democracy, and as such, we cannot simply move on. I have been a staunch defender of democracy worldwide, especially in the Northern Triangle of Central America, where often corrupt leaders try to subvert the de democratic will of the people. In America, we cannot just turn a blind eye to those who would seek to destabilize democracy and overturn a free and fair election, and to ignore that a mob invaded the symbol of our democracy, spurred by a former president's lies about a stolen election, would be to invite, to invite it again. This commission will be protected from partisan perspectives and instead guided by the truth of what we know happened on January 6th. This is the way forward to heal from a horrible insurrection on January 6th that shook our country to its core. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our to our witnesses, Mr. Katko. Thank you so very much for appearing at the witness table in the Rules Committee. And, Mr. Chairman, if I may say parenthetically, it is time for us to get back to the regular business of uh, of uh, Congress and be having our hearings in real time and in person. And I've relayed my concerns to you in in separate communication. But seeing uh, <clears throat> Ranking Member Katko here at the table this morning, it you know, you just pick up on things while uh, while a witness is giving testimony as that you that you can't get in a in a virtual hearing. So, <clears throat> Mr. Catco, I think one of the things I heard you say uh, during your opening statement uh, was was to pose the question, "How were we so unaware?" And I think that is a very valid question, and I know it's one that I've heard members of of both political parties ask. How indeed were things? How were we so unaware and so unprepared? And I do hope there is a significant focus on answering that question, assuming that the committee is indeed constituted as you as you've outlined, and you've done a very good job of of laying out the arguments. But I do hope you keep that question foremost in your mind as you go through this. How were we so unaware and how? Were we so unprepared? And as I referenced in the uh, in the hearing, in the earlier part of the hearing on the on the appropriations side, uh, you know, there was a former president, Harry Truman. Truman used to have a saying that the buck stops here. We need to understand where the buck was supposed to stop that day, and and where, in fact, if if something was dropped, where it was dropped, and and how it was dropped, and then of course how it affected all of us. Now, Chairman McGovern, you and Chairman Thompson, if I'm correct, are the only people here who were actually in Congress when the uh, when the original 9/11 Commission was uh, when the hearings were held and and the the authorizing language for the 9/11 Commission occurred. I know Mr. Cole and I came in shortly after, so we were in Congress when we received the report of the 9/11 Commission. But you and, and Chairman Thompson were in the Congress when that uh, when that provision was was heard. And I do uh, I did go back and pull the uh, portion of I guess it was a kind of a combined uh, authorization on intelligence, uh, but it was title seven of public law 107 306. Um, well, the one I have is dated November 27, 2002. And it goes through, and there's, there is a lot of remarkable similarity between the language that was used in 2002 and the language that we have in front of us today. 
there, there are some differences and, and I really would like to ask both of our witnesses about uh, some of the distance, uh, the differences as, as I've encountered because I, I, I think they're relevant to uh, what other people may be wondering. I, I do, and, and a point that is so important and, and I just really all I need is a fairly simple and straightforward answer uh, and, and probably from Mr. Katko, but Chairman Thompson, I'm happy to hear from you on this as well. Uh, you, you designate the staff, you designate, of course, the members of the commission and the fact that there is a, an, an even distribution between uh, both political parties and House and Senate and, and appreciate that. The staff, as we all know, uh, many days we're only as good as our, our staff. Uh, the staff is... I suspect going to be appointed by the members of the commission, but it's the position of the staff director that I'm perhaps most concerned about. And that staff director, is that someone whose job description is going to involve both the uh, chairman and the vice chairman, that is the Democrat, as well as the Republican uh, members of the commission? Well, first of all, there, there has been a concern about the staffing and, and there's been some arguments that the staffing is only going to be populated by, by the, uh, uh, the majority party. That, that, that's not true. Uh, the staffing matrix is the exact same staff, staffing matrix that was used in the 9-11 Commission and the one that was recommended in the bill earlier this year that was a Republican produced bill. There's no difference. So the bottom line is uh, the chairperson in consulting with the vice chairperson in accordance with rules agreed upon by the commission may appoint and affix a staff director. So again, the chair, I'm quoting, chairperson in consultation with the vice chairperson, which is appointed by a Republican, mm -hmm. in accordance with rules agreed upon by the commission, and the commission as a whole will make the rules, uh, may appoint and fix a compensation with staff director and such other personnel as may be necessary. So it gives, a, the, it's designed the exact same way the previous commission was in 9-11 in that they make the rules, they decide in a consultation with each other who should be staff director, and then they act accordingly. And I think that ensures that it's not gonna be a partisan staff director. And I'm not sure, and my staff directors may disagree with me on my committee, mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't have the last word, uh, you know? And so I think moving forward, we're gonna have uh, a, a uh, staff that is going to have the consensus driven and is not going to have an undue influence on the process. Right. In the, in the original 9-11 uh, commission language, um, it, it's more directed as to uh, the compensation to that individual. I guess my concern is, will the staff of the minority have the autonomy to differ from the staff director uh, when that person is responsible for their employment? Oh, of course. Of, of course, will, because they're going to be able to speak to not just uh, the majority members of the commission, they're going to be able to speak to everybody. It's not going to be something where the staff is isolated from the members. The members, it's just like our staff. We're going to, they're all going to work together, for sure. Would the staff director, who's appointed then by the chairman and vice chairman, be able to discharge relief from duty any other staff member with whom they disagree? I think that depends on the rules that the committee itself formulates. Well, I, you know, again, I, the, the only reason I bring it up because I, I do think it's, it's an important uh, distinction that we need to get out there early on and everyone understand the rules by which we are, uh, we're, we're conducting this investigation. I think, if I may, um, I think you're going to have to trust the people in the point of the commission to do their job and appoint good, good people that are going to get the job done from the staff level. And, uh, it's very important, just like it was on 9-11 commission, that people that get appointed to this commission are people that are incredibly well qualified. And that's why we laid out some criteria that they have to meet in order to qualify for consideration. So I've got great faith that the leaders of both parties are gonna appoint quality people to this commission. And if you appoint quality people, you're not gonna have any sort of staffing problems in my opinion. Uh, Mr. Chairman Thompson, I, I should ask you the same question. Are you comfortable with the arrangement as it's been delineated well, in the report? You know, for our system of government to work, we have to trust each other. Uh, I am not interested in micromanaging uh, the staff. We hire professionals. 
you know, do their job and, and if we get out of the way. And so the process we have outlined in the legislation is a good process. And uh, the ranking member and myself support it. And I'm confident that once it's approved, uh, we'll go forward in that direction. So let me ask you a question, and, and this is to both of you again. Uh, we heard some discussion when Ranking Member Cole was was talking about the uh, the overall scope of the investigation as it's taken into the activity surrounding January sixth. Um, it uh, do I understand correctly that this commission will not be restricted? if it determines that it's necessary to go outside the activities of that day? The, 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 the charge is to look at uh, the facts and circumstances that caused January 6th. Whatever those facts and circumstances uh, get identified by this commission, it's within their purview to look at. I, uh, Chairman Thompson, just my my concern here is is uh, the the language as written in the the bill in front of us today. It says to build upon the investigation of other entities and to avoid unnecessary duplication by reviewing the findings, conclusions, recommendations of other executive branch, congressional, or independent bipartisan, nonpartisan commissions. So. Um, with that as the context, was that with that as the backdrop, um, you know, we found out a month ago, and it wasn't generally uh, uh, information that wasn't generally made available. It was made available to uh, members of the Intelligence Committee, and Dr. Wenstrup asked the director of the FBI about the conclusion, the FBI's conclusion that the shooting of the baseball practice that injured, so severely injured our, our minority whip, that that was a result of suicide by cop. And that was the official position until Dr. Winstrup challenged the FBI director on that finding. And, and at this point, I think it was left with, well, I'll look into it. I don't know if we have a follow-up on that, but it, the problem that I have is we're going to build upon the investigation of other entities and avoid unnecessary duplication. Well, if we're only building upon that FBI report, then we're building upon a, a, a false premise. Would I be wrong in making that assumption? Well, the only thing I can say is whatever the evidence presents itself at the time you look at it is the only thing you can go with. Now, uh, facts and circumstances change all the time. Yeah, precisely. But Precisely, and that's, and that's so, my point. Well, no, but my point is, is there's no finite entity uh, that you will have to say this is all the information. So I trust the good people who make up this commission. I trust the staffing of the commission uh, to do what's in the best interest of determining the facts and circumstances around January 6th. And I do want to know what I add in addition to I that. I do need to point out, Mr. Katko, that was President Reagan who said, trust, trust but verify. So it's the verification part of that where I'm having a problem. Yeah, I mean, listen, I understand the bottom line is the commission has, uh, has uh, will have a, a, a significant amount of flexibility and they will be able to uh, make those determinations. And I trust we populate the commission with the right type of people make the right determinations. They may see that that is relevant somehow, they may not. It, it, it's gonna, they're gonna have the flexibility to have that, 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 that option. But, but here's the problem, even as a member of Congress, I didn't have access to that FBI report that was seen in the Intelligence Committee that day. So if it wasn't for the vigilance of Dr. Winstrup, who had a problem with the way that report was worded, uh, you'd have never known that it was suicide by cop and then ultimately changed to domestic terrorism. But we wouldn't, that knowledge wouldn't be out there in sort of the general environment of knowledge that we have to, to make these decisions. Um, this commission is not going to be limited by preordained findings, period. They're going to have the ability to make additional inquiries. 
And that's the frustration I have. We will, we were all restricted by preordained findings until someone dug it up and said, this is a problem, how you phrase this. I don't know that we had access to that FBI report. I don't know if it was public knowledge. I don't know if it was in the public domain. Since this was heard in the Intelligence Committee, perhaps it wasn't. But nevertheless, the point remains that there was a significant change in the reporting language, and it's only because a member of Congress brought it to, brought it to the attention of the FBI director. So let me ask you this, um, because it does it, it is relevant in the in the language that was the 9/11 Commission language. Um, specifically, they they talked about the relation of in, of the Intelligence Committee's inquiry, and the statement in the original language of the 9/11 Commission was first review the information compiled by and the findings, conclusions, and recommendations of the joint inquiry, and after that review, pursue any appropriate areas of inquiry the Commission determines that the joint inquiry had not investigated or the joint inquiries investigation that area had not been complete. So I don't find that same type of language in the bill that we have under consideration today. And that's, again, I'm, I'm using the, the baseball shooting as just as an example, but uh, I don't know what the disposition of the, uh, the unexploded uh, IEDs that were found in various locations around the capital city that day. I don't know what the disposition of those investigations has been. So I, I guess my concern is I don't want us to narrow the focus so sharply that we aren't including some of those other things. I'm quite confident that the bill is written is gonna give them the flexibility they need to, to look at all events uh, that occurred on January 6th, as well as all events that, that they deem are rel relative thereto. The Chairman Thompson. I agree with the ranking member. Uh, you only know what you know, and if the investigation yes, at that the time, if that if the investigation at that time says one thing, and six months after the report is submitted, uh, you learn new evidence, you amend the report. But I, I just uh, trust the staff. I trust the members who make up this commission to look at the facts and circumstances around January six and come back uh, with a quality product. Thank you. I, I, pray, I pray that you're correct. I just, uh, what, what concerns me, Mr. Chairman, before I yield back my time, what concerns me is that flexibility was built into the language of the initial 9-11 uh, uh, authorization. And I don't see that flexibility built into the language that we're discussing today. If anything, it, there seems to be an avoidance of that type of flexibility. But I thank our witnesses for being here. I thank them for their for their serious efforts on what is a very serious problem. And uh, I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Uh, um, Uh Thanks, Mr. Chair. And I just want to begin by saying to Mr. Katko, I thank you for your guts. I thank you you for your fidelity to America and to the Constitution. And I want to say to Mr. Thompson, my chairman from Homeland Security many, many years ago, thank you for your leadership, sir. Um, you said something that was in one sentence, summed it up for me. You said, they came for the vice president, who's a Republican, they came for the speaker, who's a Democrat, but what they really came to do was hurt America. And this whole thing gets me so angry and upset because we should all be together on this. There should not have been a letter from the minority leader. And I understand we're all entitled to our own perspectives and things, but as a, as a group, we were attacked. And we need to act as a group in response. The country was attacked. And so, Mr. Thompson, if, um, were, there, were there things uh, give me a couple examples where, in the give and take with Mr. Katko, uh, you gave something that you just assume not, but in, in terms of reaching consensus so that we can come together in a united fashion, um, 
give me a couple of those, and I'm going to ask Mr. Katko the same question. Well, first of all, we both agree that a commission was important. Uh, we talked about the composition in terms of the numbers. Uh, we talked about whether we should have a commission that involved the executive branch putting membership onto the commission, or should we just leave it as a legislative uh, initiative? Uh, so we finally got to that point. Uh, we talked about uh, the variance and subpoena power that Minority Leader talked about in his letter. Uh, we had some findings uh, in the original language, uh, and we felt that it would be best to take it out so that we could leave the commission uh, with a blank slate to come with what, what they determined over the, the period of time. Um, uh, we both agreed to try to the extent practicable not to make this an election issue for next year. That's why we sunset the report at December 31 of this year before anybody get a chance to qualify for election next year. So we tried to take as much of the politics out of the commission so that we could address uh, what we thought uh, uh, was the scope and circumstances behind January 6th. So back and forth, uh, as you know, when staff gets to tweaking language, uh, it can get kind of crazy. And then uh, the ranking member and myself would have to say, well, that's not really an issue. Uh, for us, uh, we'll just take it like this and staff kind of walk off upset. But, <laughs> but you know, that's kind of the way, way it works. Okay, Mr. Katko. What... Yeah, I, I echo all my chairman sentiments. He eloquently stated that. The only other thing we concluded was that we wanted this commission to be productive, so he said no one from Congress could be on it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just kidding. But uh, I, I, everything about uh, Congressman... Uh, uh, Chairman uh, Thompson said I agree with completely. So it reminded me, uh, Benny, Mr. Thompson, when I was first on your committee, one of the very, well, it was a couple hearings in, I was debating with Dan Lundgren about a certain point on a certain bill, and you told the two of us to please exit the committee room, to go out and iron it out between two attorneys and don't come back until we have a deal. And we did that, and that really um, made an impression on me uh, as to how you approach things. So that's that's why I uh, wanted to understand sort of the give and take. I I guess my fear here, and I'm saying this to the whole committee, but particularly to my Republican colleagues. I, uh, Chairman McGovern, read that little quote from a staffer who wondered about what this was going to do uh, with Mr. Trump's temper and, and all of that. And I just, I, I really do say this, and, and you all can be upset with me or not as you choose. Um, there, and, and that's why I, I thanked, I, I'm fearful of an allegiance to Donald Trump, who in my opinion is a miserable, miserable person and was a lousy leader Others might have a different opinion of that, but uh, allegiance to him, I think this uh, product that you two have put together as allegiance to America, as allegiance to the country, as allegiance to the Constitution. And I think um, we all just need to step back, whether I'm a Democrat and I think Barack Obama or Joe Biden can do no wrong, at the end of the day, I've got to be the fidelity I feel must to be this to, must be to this country, and uh, I'm fearful. I didn't get a chance to say anything on the funding uh, for hardening the capital and and supporting the capital police, but Mr. Reschenthaler and I had a had some debates about this uh, last week, and I just feel like we've got to condemn what happened. We've got to get to the bottom of it. We've got to support our police. We've got to support this commission. And we have to do it as one, as e pluribus unum. And I'm going to yield back to the chair. 
Thank you, Mr. Reschenthaler. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to associate uh, myself with our ranking members' remarks, and for the sake of time, I'm going to yield back. Thank you. Mr. Raskin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, just start by commending and praising uh, Chairman Thompson and Congressman Capco for their, uh, their great hard work on this and their patriotism and their seriousness and for their exemplary bipartisanship, which um, sparkles like a diamond in the rough uh, today. So uh, we all owe them a debt of gratitude, and I think history will come to record what you've done um, as, as, a pivotal, uh, as a pivotal moment for our country. So I'm delighted to support the legislation, which is Republicans, appointees, five Democratic appointees, um, equal subpoena power. And um, the point of the commission is not to have a, a partisan food fight, which too much of politics uh, devolves into today, but instead, as Mr. Capco puts it so succinctly, to get to the facts. It's about the facts. It's all about the facts of what happened. Um, so I commend uh, the gentleman for basing their legislation on the 9-11 Commission, um, whose outstanding work and report were critical for helping America to understand what had happened with the uh, atrocities that took place on that day. And uh, the work of that commission really helped the country to get through the trauma of those events in a productive and creative and um, forward-looking way. This is the right model for the January 6th commission. And it's right because January 6th was a violent assault on American democracy and on I think, Jamie, you, you have to unmute. I'm sorry. It's right also because the events of January 6th were terribly dangerous for all of us. My sentiments were captured well by Senator Lindsey Graham, who said on January 6th, um, all of us could have died. They could have had a bomb. And as we know, there were explosive devices left at the Democratic National Committee and the Republican National Committee um, on that day. There were uh, more than 800 people, to my knowledge, who entered the building without going through metal detectors and with no security screening at all. And there were tons of weapons uh, that were used on that day and that were found and confiscated um, on that day. And as everyone knows, um, there were several deaths that took place and it's remarkable that more people didn't die. And that is a testament to the uh, absolute heroism and courage of the Capitol Police officers and the Metropolitan Police Department and other police forces that came to our rescue. And I hope that their voice is going to be heard um, in a thorough and comprehensive process. It should not just be the people at the top of the hierarchy who participate in the commission's work, but as well the people uh, who were on the front lines and who participated in what was described to us at the Senate trial as medieval style warfare with waves and waves of people coming in and attacking our officers. Uh, and we know that there are officers who had their eyes gouged, one lost three fingers in the attack, there were brain injuries, uh, traumatic um, uh, head injuries. There was uh, at least one officer who had a heart attack. Uh, many of them uh, suffered other kinds of wounds and um, uh, injuries in the process, more than 140 of them wounded and or hospitalized because of what took place. Okay, so um, I think that the commission is befitting the gravity of these events. Um, President Lincoln would have known exactly how serious this was. If you go back and look at President Lincoln's uh, Lyceum address, which I would urge every member of Congress to do before voting on this commission, um, Lincoln said something really interesting. He said, all of the armies of Europe, all of the armies of Africa and Asia could not conquer America, but we could be destroyed from within by the dissension from within. It could not come from abroad, he said, but it could spring up from the inside. Um, and we've got to keep that very much in mind. So 
if you know if it is serious enough to have a 9-11 commission to deal with the devastating attack on the country from outside, certainly um, it warrants having a January 6th commission to deal with the devastating attack that came from within. And um, I, I want to, you know, again, I, I don't, I don't mean to lionize these gentlemen just for doing their jobs, but um, in this environment in Washington where everything is partisan, I want to uh, say a word about partisanship and bipartisanship and nonpartisanship, and then invite each of them to say something about it. Look, let's, we, we shouldn't play make believe and we shouldn't pretend to be naive. We know that a lot of what goes on in politics deals with partisanship. When we run for office in America, we run as part of political parties. That's part of our system under the First Amendment. Partisanship, in that sense, political parties is a sign of health of the country. You know, one way you get rid of partisanship is you just get rid of political parties. You move to a one-party state, one dictator who controls everything. Well, we don't do that in America. We allow people to run in different parties, and those parties articulate public agendas. They help to mobilize voters. They send signals to people generally about what candidates stand for when you don't really know who they are. So that kind of partisanship to me is fine. But once we get into office, I think we do have to remember where the word party comes from. It comes from the French word Parti, which means a part. Our party is just part of the whole. We've got to try to look out for the whole. And you know what? We know how to do that. Every member of this committee, every member of the House knows how to be nonpartisan, I think, because we do it when it comes to constituent work. Someone calls my office, they need help on VA benefits or Social Security or Medicare, Medicaid. We never ask them, are you a Democrat? Are you a Republican? Are you an independent? We just say, that person's one of my constituents. That word means a member of that, but considering they're part of who I am and part of what my leadership is. And so I want to commend Mr. Capco and uh, Chairman Thompson for bringing that mentality to this issue, because it really doesn't have to do with partisanship. As the chairman said, all of us were attacked on that day. All of us could have died. They were, they, we could hear them yelling, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence. And they set up a gallows outside. They were trying to assassinate the Speaker of the House. They thought that they could engage in vigilante justice and uh, take these people away and, you know, dispense with them, which is what some of their forebears did in Michigan uh, when they had a plan to kidnap the governor of Michigan. So this is very serious business. It's an attack on the constitutional order. So I just want to commend the gentleman and invite them to reflect on the work they did and how they weren't thinking about it in terms of the next election or some of the executive branch or a former executive, or whatever, they were thinking about it as American public servants. And I want to know, you know, what made you guys different? And perhaps I could start with you, uh, uh, Chairman Thompson, and then come to you, Mr. Tepco. Well, thank you, Mr. Raskin. Um, uh, the only thing I can say is uh, the ranking member and I take our responsibilities uh, very seriously. Uh, we agree to agree, and we agree to disagree, but we don't stop talking. And part of the strength of the committee uh, for longstanding has been the ability to do that. And, and I think uh, that transcends politics and, and everything else. Uh, I respect how my ranking member got elected, and he respects how I got elected, but at the end of the day, uh, it's what's good for the country. And, and uh, our committee is unique uh, because the enemy we face uh, doesn't look at party, uh, doesn't look at race, doesn't look at gender. They just look at whether or not you're an American. And if you keep that front and center in your deliberations, in your debate, uh, at the end of the day, you'll have a finished product that we can all agree with. Thank you. And Mr. Katko. Yeah, I, listen, the, the very definition of our committee, Homeland Security, uh, means that uh, Chairman Thompson and I have an awesome responsibility to keep this great country safe and to make sure that we're doing things to keep it safe. You can't do that when you're quibbling over, over things that are really trivial. And we both understand the greater good here we both dispense with our politics to do what the greater good is. I mean, we're not the second coming of Christ here, but the bottom line is we just believe that working together, you get a lot more done. And this committee is 
far too important, far too important for us to, uh, to let it devolve into political uh, calculations. And so um, he's in the majority and I give him even more credit because he, he didn't have to bend if he didn't want to, but he did. And that's what I give Chairman Thompson an immense amount of credit for and I have an immense amount of respect for him. He loves his country just as much as I do and I'm sure all of you, but sometimes people talk about bipartisanship but they don't walk the walk and um, Chairman Thompson walks the walk and I'm, I'm glad to walk with him on this and other things. It's for the good of our country, not the good of us. That's important. Well, thank you, Mr. Katko. And I, I would just say to, to close out this interesting discussion um, that um, you know, both of you have exemplified what a lot of us talk about. And I wanna thank you for doing that. And by the way, you know, we really should talk about nonpartisanship, Mr. Chairman, because there are millions and millions of Americans who are not in either of our parties you know, and belong to other parties or their independents, and they need to be represented and reflected in our work too, and in the work of this commission, which ultimately is not about getting anybody elected or diselected or anything. It's about getting at the truth, as Mr. Kako uh, put it, getting at the facts of what happened and then making sure it never happens again, because we have a serious security threat in the country. We need to fortify ourselves against it, and we got to make sure this never happens to us again. I yield back to you, Mr. McGovern. Thank you very much. I, I've just been informed by staff that I think some of our witnesses may be under a little bit of a time crunch, so we, uh, if we could just kind of keep it to the uh, point and, and if we get everybody through here, that'd be great. Uh, Ms. Fishbach. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I'd just like to associate myself with the, the remarks of Ranking Member Cole, but um, um, I do have one quick question for uh, Ranking Member Katko. Um, and, and Ranking Member, I appreciate all of your work on this and and um, and I'm pleased that you were successful on some of those um, points that you uh, mentioned in your opening statement. But I'm also wondering if you think there are any additional areas where um, improvements could be made and we could find even uh, stronger uh, bipartisan balance in this bill. Well, there's always improvements that can be made, but I really do think we, 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 we struck a very good chord here. I mean, the, the bill, <laughs> yeah, we have an equal number on each side. No one can have undue influence on the other. Uh, they, they, they have their marching orders, they have their background, and we have standards uh, which each person on the committee must meet before they can even be considered to be on the committee. To me, I'm very pleased with how it came out. And I'm, I'm sure there's gonna be tweaks here and there, but overall, I'm quite, quite, quite happy with the, with the end product here. Um, just one more um, real quick, and, and either the chairman or a ranking member can answer. Is there an opportunity um, when the report comes out or during, you know, to provide a disagreeing or a dissenting um, view in the final report? Uh, well, you know, we all have the ability to, to respond, but I think for the integrity of the commission, uh, whatever the product is, uh, that's the product they stand behind. And I think that's the spirit by which uh, the ranking member and I put forth the, the legislation. And, and so, um, Mr. Chair, just to be clear, there is there's no opportunity for like a minority report or a dissenting view report. Well, uh, if the, the the minority members on the committee, which there's no minority, but if there's a minority. Uh, that feels strong enough that it should be included, then I think they would have to work that out themselves. Uh, uh, I think we, if we constitute the committee uh, with the Republican and Democratic leadership, then to, to our job is complete. Yeah, I agree. They, they have the ability to do that if they want to, but um, I, I agree with Benny that I, I don't anticipate there being severe differences. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much to the chair and ranking member from Homeland Security um, for recognizing the importance to the country, to our constituents, um, to having a, a shared truth and, and a shared understanding of what happened on January 6th. Um, just two quick points. We've had a lot of hearings already about what happened on January 6th, but they've been siloed. We had impeachment hearings, which looked at certain angles. We've had hearings in house admin that have looked at the 
um, reports from the inspector generals of House Capitol Police and the architect of the Capitol. We've had hearings in other venues that have um, heard testimony from the Metropolitan Police or from the FBI. We need this overarching commission to get a shared understanding. And as there was some discussion earlier, to pull together to pieces to look at what has already happened and not have to duplicate it, but perhaps fill in the blanks or re-examine certain angles. So I, I'm really looking forward to having that happen. And of course, the, the Department of Justice um, also has a lot of information that I'm sure um, will be relevant. I've, I've stated before, the review to date has really been limited, the, the bipartisan review to date has really been limited to the response to January 6th, but we also need to look at the causes in order to respond and to prevent such attacks upon our country and upon this building in the future. Because without that shared truth, we cannot have healing, we cannot have accountability, and we cannot have unity. Um, with that, um, just thank you again for your work to bring this to the table, and I would yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Morelli. I would again like to associate myself with uh, many of the comments made by my, my, my colleagues. This is such an important issue, but more importantly, in some ways, the way that the chair and the ranking member have come together uh, is really what I envision Congress to be all about. People who uh, may have differences, but work them out for the interest of the American public. And I'm very grateful to the chair for his hard work and want to congratulate him. Uh, equally to my uh, good friend from upstate New York, my uh, colleague, and my neighbor just to the east, uh, the ranking member, Mr. Katko. So thank you both for uh, your your uh, investment of time, energy, thoughtfulness, and uh, for your uh, work on behalf of the American public. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much. I don't see Mr. Desanya. Mr. Desanya, I don't see um, uh, Ms. Ross. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be very brief. Um, as President John F. Kennedy wrote, leadership and learning are indispensable to one another, and we have a responsibility as public servants and leaders to seek greater understanding and encourage accountability. And um, doing that in a bipartisan way is absolutely the best way to do it. All members, re regardless of their party, take the same oath to defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I want to applaud uh, Representatives Thompson and Ketko for introducing this important bipartisan bill. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, Mr. DeGoose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to echo uh, your comments uh, at the outset of today's hearing. And I want to say thank you to Chairman Thompson and to Representative Ketko for their incredible leadership uh, and their moral courage in terms of working together on a bipartisan basis to come up with a, a, a package, in my view, that is eminently reasonable and, and a commission structure that I think uh, will uh, enable this commission to ultimately uh, do its important very supportive and, again, just really appreciative of, of, uh, of their leadership. And with that, I will yield back. Thank you very much. Are there any other member that wish to ask a question of uh, Chairman Thompson or Ranking Member Katko? Seeing none, let me thank you both for being here. Um, I, we all appreciate your work. Um, I think you did the right thing. And, uh, uh, and uh, let's hope we have a good vote uh, on the House floor when it comes up. But uh, with that, you are dismissed. Um, now I want to welcome our next panel to testify on their amendments to H.R. 3233 and H.R. 3237, Representative Wenstrup of Ohio and Representative Crenshaw of Texas. And we'll begin with Mr. Wenstrup. See Mr. Wenstrup is. If we don't see Mr. Wenstrup, maybe we'll go to Mr. We'll go to Mr. Crenshaw for us. We'll wait for Mr. Wenstrup to appear. So, Mr. Mr. Crenshaw, the floor is yours. Can, uh, can either Mr. Crenshaw or Mr. Wenstrup hear me? 
Can anybody hear me? <laughs> I can hear you, Mr. Chair. Dan, unmute. Okay. I can hear you, Mr. Chair. Okay. So we just need to get uh, uh, Mr. Wenstrup or Mr. Crenshaw. Good. All right, Mr. Wenstrup, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, you're, you're on. Am I coming through now? You're coming through beautifully. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Now I can hear you, I believe. Yeah, we good? Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, as you, as you know, I uh, offered an amendment uh, to, to this bill, and I thank everyone for all the hard work that uh, has gone into it. But this amendment would simply add the events of June... June 14, 2017, baseball field shooting, targeting dozens of members of Congress to the scope of the commission's work and report on domestic terrorism directed at Congress. It adds at the end of section three, paragraph one, the following, and to investigate and report upon the facts and causes related to the June 14, 2017, domestic terrorist attack on members of Congress. Now, as I look at the committee there today, uh, to no one's fault, I, I recognize that no one, I believe, on this committee were present that day at the baseball field. And, you know, I hold the events of, of January 6th as, as highly as I do the events of June 14, 2017, as well as what occurred on, on Good Friday. But on June, a little background, on June 14, 2017, a gunman opened fire on members of Congress at a congressional baseball practice in Alexandria, Virginia, after staking out the locations for months. Members only survived due to the presence of Republican Whip Steve Scalise, who had a Capitol Police detail with him. Now there is universal and undisputed recognition that officers Crystal Griner and David Bailey acted admirably, and Congress can study the event to better inform Capitol Police's identification, preparedness, and response to future threats. These two officers, they were outgunned. He had a rifle and a handgun. They had two handguns, and for a while, they only had one handgun, and both Capitol Police were wounded, and uh, there were five people wounded. There was 136 rounds fired. Again, both Capitol Police were actually injured, fortunately not killed. And the, this, the event was only finalized when Alexandria Police showed up. So the FBI belatedly labeled the baseball shooting event an incident of domestic terrorism under the umbrella of domestic violent extremism, similar terminology as this bill uses for the events of January 6th. And on that day, the balance of power of our democracy may well have been changed because if not for Capitol Police, 20 to 30 members of Congress may have been killed. So including this attack in the commission's scope would help identify broader key understandings, including how well officers are equipped to respond in real time and the Capitol Police's capacity to immediately launch a response to such acts. The lifeblood of democracy isn't always in the building. Protecting the building and all those in it, all those that work in it is important. So by the commission including this attack in its report and possibly Good Friday attack, which, you know, for all we know, this guy may have loaded up a car full of explosives and performed a vehicle-borne IED type of event. But Congress can better be informed how to identify the threat and prevent targeted domestic terrorism against members both on and off the Capitol Hill complex. We need to explore the vulnerabilities, the weaknesses, as well as the strengths. Capitol Police will appreciate it, and especially considering the danger that they are in, that their lives are in. We should be looking at all of these things. Paul Ryan, after the attack in June of 17, came on the floor of the House and said, an attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. This event needs to be considered as well. We need to look at our security vulnerabilities on and off campus. And I, I strongly encourage you to accept this amendment in fairness to all members and staff and all of those that participate in this democracy. And I think that it's very important that we address all these issues. And, and I would appreciate your support for this amendment. Thank, Thank you very much. Mr. We uh, Mr. Uh, Crenshaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, ranking member for considering my amendments uh, to HR 3237. Uh, I think this is a pretty common sense amendment. Um, 
let, let me lay out the framework for, for everybody. I'm not sure the amendment would make sense uh, if you just read it uh, briefly. So Capitol Police have a special unit within them. It's called CERT, C-E-R-T, which stands for uh, Containment and Emergency Response Team. Think of it like a SWAT team. And the problem with this SWAT team is that it can't actually respond to emergencies uh, in a timely manner. And I speak to this from a tactical perspective. Okay, if I, if I consider myself a quick reaction force of some sort, that means that my gear is ready to go and I have a response time that has been validated and practiced. Uh, they have no such thing. The reason they have no such thing is because they need to be recalled. They need to be recalled. They need to be able to check. They need to check out their weapons from the armory uh, inside the Capitol. They need, they need to check out special equipment. There's a couple people who have keys to those armories. They have to track them down, get them, uh, then suit up, and then respond to whatever emergency is taking place. Now, these are these are our, our most highly trained tacticians, but they have no equipment with them. And so my bill looks to 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 fix that. Um, and I learned about all this after conversations with Capitol Police uh, post January 6th. Um, on January 6th in particular, when they responded to the recall, they had trouble getting into the Capitol. You can imagine why. Cities locked down, navigate traffic congestions, they're working their way through checkpoints. Uh, once there, to, to assemble the specialized equipment, they ran into problems of access. Uh, different items were stored in different locations. Uh, some lo some locations were locked. Uh, he was not accessible. Somebody who was on the front lines uh, with the with the crowd in January on, on that day had the key, couldn't get in. Um, so how do they fix this? If they had take home vehicles, so they don't actually have police vehicles. Um, they don't have. They have to take their personal vehicles to the Capitol when they're recalled. Now, if they had police vehicles, say the way our canine units do. Uh, they would be able to run lights, they'd be able to run sirens, they'd be able to uh, much more quickly access what they need to to get to a crisis. They would not need to find somebody um, to help them. Uh, we would also need their equipment to be secured and staged in those vehicles if they were to be a true quick reaction force, a true emergency response force. Now, it's worth noting, January 6th was not the first time that this problem happened, of course. Uh, my, my colleague just talked about the, the, the shooting, uh, the, the, the GOP congressional baseball game shooting. That was another case where uh, this recall system simply did not work. And what they did instead was you know, they had to go all the way back to the Capitol and then go all the way to Alexandria. And, and of course, by the time that actually happened, the, the, the situation was long over. So we got to address this problem. Um, my amendment begins to address the problem by requiring a report on the cost of the vehicles, the necessary equipment, assessment of the effect of providing home to work vehicles, common practices and lessons learned from other specialized units, and a recommendation from the Capitol Police on obtaining and providing home to work vehicles for CERT members. So this report is just intended to help us understand the cost and effectiveness and will allow us to take appropriate action to ensure that Capitol Police CERT team has the equipment they need to accomplish their mission. Uh, again, thank you all for your consideration and look forward to answering any questions you may have. I yield back. Thank you very much. I appreciate you both uh, coming before the committee to testify. Are there any questions of the witnesses uh, on the Republican side? Mr. Cole? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to, first of all, I support both the amendments and certainly hope that they're made in order. And I want to thank both the gentlemen for bringing them. And I want to say, I, I think this is really something that to really think about, uh, because, yeah, obviously there's a political dimension to January 6th, but I think both of these gentlemen are talking, too, uh, about literally the nuts and bolts of how do you secure the place and how do you keep members safe. Uh, and I've reflected a lot on the fact that I, and I say this not judgmentally at anybody. I don't think what happened here on January the 6th could have happened at the White House. In other words, I think the security is fundamentally different for the chief executive uh, than it is here. And there may be good reasons for that. I mean, I, I, you know, we all celebrate this being an open place and we all want people here and things of that nature, although there's certainly plenty of White House tours and uh, it's not uh, an impenetrable fortress, uh, but it's more, it's much harder, it's much more secure than we are. So. 
I just think these actually get us at something that's really important for any commission uh, to, to consider. Uh, and uh, particularly, you know, both these gentlemen, you know, sadly, uh, and, and to their credit, have enormous experience in dealing with the consequences of this, or in Mr. Crenshaw's case, uh, he's a highly trained warrior himself. And, and these are just practical things that I think probably any commission that's thinking about security of this building uh, and the people that are in it. And, and we all wonder about, you know, what's the appropriate security when we're away from the building, as was the case in the baseball game. You know, what should we do? I don't know that any of these have ever been resolved. Uh, and I've often uh, wondered uh, about, uh, again, how fortunate we were to have, uh, you know, Steve Scalise there. And people won't know this, but I will tell you, uh, Mr. Chairman and the committee, uh, when Republicans were transitioning to become the majority back in 2010, there were committees set up to look at a whole variety of things. One of them was security. I happened to be the vice chairman of that uh, particular committee. It was a broader scope, but that was one of the things we looked at. I remember the sergeant of arms at the time coming to talk to us all, and he said, uh, you know, there's really only one person in the chain of government that's important, and that's the speaker, because the speaker's in line for succession to the president. The rest of you, the function of government doesn't depend on the minority leaders and the whips and the conference chair. Then he said, and at that time, uh, you know, there was a great deal, of, well, there has been a great deal of threat of violence, and the former speaker, then the minority leader, now our speaker again, he said, but you know, there's a lot of threats against the former speaker. Uh, so we think that she ought to have security too, and we all agreed with that. Um, and then it was said, well, you know, it, it seems like that probably the majority leader, really, you don't really need a security detail, but they're used to having it. And so if they're going to have it, you got to give it to the you know, to the uh, minority leader as well. So we got down to that. And then we got to the whip. And I remember making the crack at the time. Well, gosh, the whip surely, and this cost about $5 million a year to provide the security. The whip surely doesn't need security. The only person that ever gets mad at the whip are, are the members. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we, we came this close to removing security from the whip, which later was Steve Scalise. And that security wouldn't have been there. Uh, had we done that. Uh, and it's, it's just sheer accident that, uh, as Mr. Winstrup points out, that uh, they were there. And uh, again, I just say this to think, the, I think these amendments are really good amendments to make us think through some of these very real problems in a very practical way. And I don't, I don't know that I have the answer, but I certainly hope that uh, the commission, if it's formed, uh, uh, you know, considers these kind of things. So with that, uh, I took more time than I intended to, Mr. Chairman, thank you. But again, urge the uh, support for both amendments. Are there, further, back, are there further questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. You, you heard my comments during the, the general portion of the hearing and uh, both amendments I think are, are well thought out amendments, they're important, and I encourage the Rules Committee to make them in order. I'll yield back. And I just uh, wanted to thank both gentlemen for their testimony. I think uh, both amendments are, are fair amendments. I don't know that I'm going to support them, but I think they're fair amendments. Uh, Mr. Crenshaw, I think yours is probably subsumed in the supplemental uh, that we are talking about. And, and Mr. Winstrup, I... I appreciate what you said about the the, uh, the attack at the baseball field. I was over at the, the Democratic field, and you know we had to kind of hunker down in the in the dugout, and you know until all of this uh, was uh, we were given the all clear sign. But it kind of reminded me too of uh, when Gabby Giffords was shot. A lot of us did this government and the grocery kind of a an event, and um, I. Uh, was doing one at the very same time she was, or thereabouts, and you know she got shot, and federal judge killed, and a number of other people killed, and you know so there is a a, a need for all of us uh, to be there needs to be a security element for all of us when we're at home, when we're at the baseball field. I don't know exactly how far it it uh, spreads, but uh, I I would encourage 
the commission whether your uh, amendment is adopted or not to kind of just take a look at general security measures. And certainly I think the supplemental uh, is designed to do that. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. For any further questions? Seeing none, um, I want to thank the witnesses uh, for being here. You're now excused. Are there any other members who wish to testify in HR 3237 or HR 3233? Seeing none, this closes the hearing on HR 3237 and HR 3233. Uh, at this time, uh, the chair will entertain a motion from the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now move the committee grant HR 3233, the National Commission to investigate the January 6th attack on the US Capitol Complex Act, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Homeland Security or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. The rule provides one motion to recommit. The rule further provides for consideration of HR 3237, the emergency security supplemental to respond to January 6 Appropriations Act 2021 under a closed rule. The, the rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Appropriations or their designees. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit. Here are the motion of the gentleman from Maryland. Are there any uh, amendments or discussion? Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule to make an order, amendment number 10 uh, to HR 3233 offered by Mr. Rutherford of Florida. This amendment would ensure that law enforcement investigations can continue without interference Mr. Chairman, uh, we can all agree that uh, what happened on January 6th is certainly unacceptable and those responsible for the security breach need to be held accountable. I'm happy that process is underway. Uh, that being said, many of those involved were already under active investigation by law enforcement. This amendment would help ensure that the commission and its report in no way impede the law enforcement's ability to continue these investigations without interference. And together with the help of law enforcement, we can uh, work to prevent something uh, like this from happening again in the future. So I think Mr. Rutherford is, is widely known on this committee, of course, has a law enforcement background, knows what he's talking about. This sharpens the language. I know we have some language that right. discourages uh, any interference with law enforcement. But this would, uh, would make that a little bit tougher and clearer in my view. So the that's uh, move the amendment. Thank you. you heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? Um, I think that the language in the bill currently, my, my personal feeling is, is sufficient, but uh, uh, we'll have a vote on the call amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Can no. you the chair the no's have it? Chair, on that, I'd request a recorded vote. Recorded vote is the request. The clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli, Morelli is no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross, no. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Nagoose, no. Mr. Nagoose, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushenthaler, aye. Mr. Rushenthaler, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, no, no, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk, report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments. Further amendments. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Burgess. Uh, I have an amendment uh, to grant the necessary waivers and make an order amendment number nine. Uh, this is the amendment offered by uh, Dr. Winstrup of Ohio. And this is the amendment that would add the June 14th, 2017 domestic terrorist attack on members of Congress to the scope of the commission. 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're already here to create a commission to investigate January 6th. You know, we heard the testimony from Dr. Winstrup, and I think he's uh, got a valid point. We need to broaden the commission's scope to include other domestic acts of political violence taken against this body, and I urge the amendment be made in order. I appreciate the gentleman's amendment, and certainly that was a very traumatic day. Um, I, you know, I, which, you know, I, I think when the my colleague's party was in charge at the time, I mean, one could have created a commission back then to look into it. But also it begs the question of what about the attack against Gabby Giffords, uh, as Mr. Perlmutter pointed out. Look, what we're dealing with here today is very is, is, is very focused on what happened on January 6th. Uh, and so I would urge uh, no vote on the Burgess Amendment. Uh, for the voters on the Burgess Amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those no, no. No. Is the chair the no's have it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask for the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays have been requested. Corporal, call the roll. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Perlmutter? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Mr. Raskin? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Ms. Scanlon? No. Mr. Morelli? Mr. Morelli's no. Mr. Morelli? No. Mr. Desonier? No. Mr. Desonier? No. Ms. Ross? No. Ms. Ross? No. Mr. Neguse? No. Mr. Neguse? No. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Cole? Aye. Mr. Burgess? Votes aye. Mr. Burgess? Aye. Mr. Rushendaller? Aye. Mr. Rushendaller? Aye. Mrs. Fishbach? Aye. Mrs. Fishbach? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman? No. Court report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Chairman, uh, Burgess. Uh, also, uh, has to make an order amendment number two. Uh, this was the um, amendment offered by our colleague Dan Crenshaw of Texas that would require the chief of the United States Capitol Police to submit a report to Congress on the viability of providing home to work vehicles for members of the containment emergency response team for the purposes of emergency recall. Uh, we heard Dr. Uh, uh, Representative Crenshaw's compelling testimony, and I think it is important that we consider this amendment. And I think there's precedence for this as other special teams have take home vehicles. And it's an important matter to consider, and I urge that this amendment be made in order. I heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? Hearing none, the voters on the Burgess Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Continue no. no. the chair that knows have it. Mr. Chairman, I request the yeas and nays. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Mr. Morelli. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier. No. Ms. Ross. No. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Neguse, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess, votes aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Rushendaller, aye. Mr. Rushendaller, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Oh. Mr. Chairman, no. Uh, clerk, report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Further amendments? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rushenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to the rule to make an order amendment number eight to HR 3233, which is offered by Mr. Smith. Mr. Chairman, this amendment requires the report to be due prior to the end of the fiscal year. The commission must operate on an expedited timeline to produce findings and recommendations by 31 December 2021. While we agree with the commission, while we agree that the commission needs to produce a report before the end of the year, we believe it would be more appropriate for the report to be due before the end of that fiscal year to ensure any security recommendations were received in time to make it into the end of year spending bill. Uh, thank you for the consideration, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. I heard the gentleman's amendment. Any discussion? Hearing none, the voters on the Russian Thaler Amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 You can hear the no's have it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I request a recorded vote. Recorded vote has been requested. 
Mrs. Torres. No. Mrs. Torres. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon. No. Mr. Morelli. Morelli. No. Mr. Morelli. No. Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier. No. Ms. Ross. No. Ms. Ross. No. Mr. Negus. No. Mr. Negus. No. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Rushenthaler. Aye. Mr. Rushenthaler. Aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Yes. Mrs. Fishbach. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman. No. Court report the total. Four yeas and nine nays. Was not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Chair, I have an amendment. The general ladies recognized. Mr. Chair, I have an amendment to the rule of to make an order amendment number seven offered by Mr. Johnson from Louisiana. This amendment requires commission staff to be hired in a bipartisan manner by agreement between the chairperson and the vice chairperson. Uh, as currently written, the staffing for this commission will be conducted by the chairperson in consultation with the vice chairperson, given the chair and giving the chair the final say on personnel decisions. In order to keep this a bipartisan commission, truly, truly bipartisan, staffing decisions should be made in agreement with the vice chair rather than just in consultation. This amendment would simply use language that already exists within the bill to ensure the commission staff are hired in a truly bipartisan manner. I urge, uh, Mr. Chair, I urge adoption of the amendment. I thank the gentleman. I would urge a no vote on this. I mean, I, I have to say, um, I think Mr. Katko was very persuasive and deserves a lot of credit for the bipartisan nature um, and the agreement that he and Chairman Thompson reached. And um, I mean, I, again, I, I have to, I mean, I don't think you get more bipartisan than what we just saw. So I, um, uh, the vote is now on the Fishbach Amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, no. 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 Either chair the no's have it. Mr. Chair, I request your court vote. The court of vote has been requested. Mrs. Torres. Mr. Perlmutter. No. Mr. Perlmutter, no. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin, no. Ms. Scanlon. No. Ms. Scanlon, no. Mr. Morelli. Morelli, no. Mr. Morelli, no. Mr. Desonier. No. Mr. Desonier, no. Ms. Ross. No. Ms. Ross, no. Mr. Negus. No. Mr. Negus, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Burgess. Aye. Mr. Burgess, aye. Mr. Russian Dollar. Aye. Mr. Russian Dollar, aye. Mrs. Fishbach. Aye. Mrs. Fishbach, aye. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. How is Ms. Torres recorded? Mrs. Torres is not recorded. Torres, no. Mrs. Torres, no. Work report the total. Four yeas, nine nays. Amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Hearing none, the voters on the motion uh, from the gentleman from Maryland. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Oh. Either chair, the ayes overwhelmingly have it. Um, Mr. Chair, I have a request to record and vote. I guess if the, you got to get, get your I, team kind of more enthusiastic here. It depends on the room in which you're sitting. Uh, uh, <laughs> the clerk will uh, call the uh, roll. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Perlmutter. Aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Mr. Raskin. Aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Ms. Scanlon. Aye. Mr. Morelli. Morelli is aye. Mr. Morelli. Aye. Mr. Desonier. Aye. Mr. Desonier. Aye. Ms. Ross. Aye. Ms. Ross, aye. Mr. Negus. Aye. Mr. Negus, aye. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Burgess. No. Mr. Burgess, no. Mr. Rushendaller. No. Mr. Rushendaller, no. Mrs. Fishbach. No. Mrs. Fishbach, no. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Work report the total. Nine yeas, four nays. Uh, and the motion is agreed to, and I will carry this for the uh, majority. 
And I will carry it for the Republicans, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cole will carry it for the Republicans. Um, and so that is it. And there's nothing else this week, I hope and pray. And uh, without objection, the committee is adjourned.